action. Hey, how you doing? Welcome to Redline Radio. Eddie, uh, I like a great tasting, less filling. I like to have one before every time we record a podcast. I didn't know if you know that about me. That's beautiful. You uh, you should have one because it is a great tasting, less filling beer. It is the beer of Chicago, beer of the summer, beer of the year, of every year. I get that inspiration from Joe Buck. When he sits down for a national broadcast, he likes a cold one. I think... I think he should be grabbing a Miller Lite. Anybody should. This summer, this is the summer of Miller Lite. This is the summer of Tom. This is the summer of Eddie. This is the summer of Carl. It's the summer of you. But it's also the summer of you reaching into the cooler, grabbing a cold one, a great tasting, less filling. Eddie, how can people get some? Yeah. So like you said, those summer moments are made that much better with Miller Lite because summer loves beer that tastes like beer. So just 96 calories, 3.2 carbs for 12 ounces. Miller Lite is the perfect light beer to sip on all summer long. Next time you're getting ready to enjoy some cold ones with your crew, go to MillerLite.com forward slash Redline to find the delivery options near you. Or obviously it's Miller Lite. You could pretty much find it anywhere that they they sell beer. It's Miller time. Celebrate responsibly. Miller Brewing Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. 96 calories and 3.2 carbs per 12 ounces. Uh, if you support Redline Radio, you know that we're diehard <coughs> Miller Lite guys. And uh, you're having some Millers with us wherever you are. It's sacrilegious to grab anything else. Uh, new guy in the office. We'll get to that in a second. But I just told him, I was like, I heard you're a new guy in the office. Congratulations. Welcome. Uh, just make sure you're not drinking any of the competitor. Like you're around here. We drink cold ones. We yeah. drink Miller Lite. That's it. Don't trigger me. Uh, one, two. The delivery option stuff, this is where it comes into play. It's summertime, backyard barbecue. You don't want to make a run. You don't have to. That cooler's running low. You just pop that phone open. You go right to the links. Yeah, that's what's nice, too. So we like delivery options. Speaking of delivery, there's another thing you can get delivered, and I know we're going to get to a red line radio. We got a loaded show. Hawk Harrelson's joining us. Dave and Chief right now are on location with Hawk Harrelson as we record this. The first ever. This guy's a hall. I mean, he's in the Hall of Fame. Live from a Hampton Inn lobby. Sounds absolutely unbelievable. White Sox Dave with his, I mean, we'll talk, you know, I'm sure he'll say it on the show, but that's got to be a top three White Sox guy for him all time. I think it's his number one. Is it? I think it is his number one. Because you can say Burley and Canerco, but those guys play, like, Hawk was there every single day. Mm -hmm. And and especially shaped a lot of those young memories and and who White Sox Dave ultimately became. So I hope this this interview is going to come up in a little bit. You guys are going to love it. I know that. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, Chicago sports fans. This is Barstool Carl. This is Eddie. And this is Redline Radio and All Gas, No Break, Chicago Sports Podcast, brought to you by Barstool Sports Chicago and Miller Lite. Miller Lite. I said during our intro with the ad reads that White Sox, Dave, and Chief are on location with Hawk Harrelson. We are in studio. It's me. It's Eddie. It's Tom. We have a new guy. I feel it's only appropriate to introduce a new guy. Welcome, Kevin, to Barstool Chicago. Where's that microphone? Introduce yourself, Kevin. How we doing, boys? Uh, Kevin, you went where to college? Virginia Tech. Okay. He's a DMV stoolie, but a Chicago sports fan. That's awesome. Exactly right. How about that? What's the Chicago sports affiliation, Kevin? Whole dad sides from Chicago. Love so, been through the pain of the Bears and the uh, the joys of the Cubs at times. Yeah. Well, welcome to the team, dude. We're having a nice summer. Appreciate it. Thank you, boys. And if you do well enough, I'm sure one day you'll sit in the dog walk studio with Ed <laughs> for a more thorough interview. Love it. Hopefully. Um, Ed, how are you doing? Good man, I'm uh, I'm here. I'm excited to get here back from the guys when they come back. I mean, Hawk Harrelson, like we said in the uh, in the ad read earlier, it's a big sit down interview face to face for White Sox, Dave. Um, how are you? How are you feeling after that uh, that showdown? Showdown is that what we would call it? Maybe you and Dave. I mean, that was a 45 minute uh, <laughs> back and forth with yes. me jumping in to do a minute ad read and jumping out. So I want to see where we're at. It is fucking very ironic and. There is humor in it involved when literally two plays later, Yasmani Grandal has like the ugliest play of the season. Yeah, the, the fumble at first base throughout <laughs> yeah. 6-1, next thing you know, three-run dong shot. And uh, it's like 6-4, and the White Sox Twitter is just melting down. And I had bet the White Sox minus one and a half as a show of solidarity between me and White Sox fans. And I should remind White Sox fans, I am cut from your cloth. My father is a diehard. He had season tickets up until the baseball strike, and he got sick of it. Um, I grew up going to White Sox games. I became a Cubs fan in like fourth grade after going to Wrigley so many times. I've told this story on the podcast before. I converted at a young age due to access and exposure to the Cubs when the White Sox were tanking and my family was losing interest. So Mm -hmm. um, I don't mean anything malicious. How am I doing from the showdown is like, I wish it wasn't a showdown. I wish we were just talking baseball and things weren't. You know, whatever. It's like I've worked so long with Dave that I get there's going to be like little personal shots in there along the way. 
and that's fine. Uh, if we show up next week and we have like a great discussion about the White Sox and their surging, and the, you know they've won three in a row, three in a row at the time recording. Kopech looked awesome against the Dodgers. That series win against the Rays was, you know, they almost blew it Saturday. I think they came back Sunday late. Jake Berger. So there's some good stories there. And if we come back next week and we're chopping it up, it's well worth it. If I don't have to, if we don't spend another, you know extended time getting into ownership decisions and we can live in the moment and talk about baseball, then it's absolutely well worth it. Yeah, I mean, honestly, that was a little too mano a mano for me to jump into at the time. I thought there was obviously points that both guys made that was like, okay. And um, I, I thought at the end of the day, like you guys are maybe arguing different things, which happens. You know, that happens to me every yeah. week on the show with uh, Portnoy. So yeah, uh, you just argue different points and you just go round and round. I mean, you know. It I, is what it is, yeah, man. Yeah, that's... I still think it's worth, like, if you're a White Sox fan, you should be, you know, up Grandal's ass. Um, now, I don't mean, like, on tw- like trashing him. I mean, like, if you've got the group chat and stuff and you're like, what the fuck, man? We suck. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. you don't really have to look further than how bad he is now versus how good he can be. Mm-hmm. That would be a good starting point. And there's a bunch of, obviously, the injuries. And I'm not the White Sox expert, but... There's a lot of stuff to talk about, and I hope that when, you know, we have this great Hawk Harrelson interview, so that's a nice treat for White Sox fans. And then, yeah, we got to get back to, you know, this, sh- this show is rooted in, uh, you know, baseball in some in some respect. And I know we're moving on. The show grows, and we're doing different things now, but there should always be a spot for this show to fucking, to, like, get into. You know, here's what I saw from Caleb Killian, and we will get into that. Mm-hmm. Like, that's what I love about this show. Like all, no matter how big Barstool gets and how, uh, you know, wherever our pet, like we should always have a spot to come down once a week and be like, yo, dude, can you fucking believe the quarterback play? Mm-hmm. Like, I hope that you end up doing, you know, you're doing the Grover stuff and the Dave Portnoy show and that's a wagon, man. The, that thing's so big and you've grown that thing huge and like the dog walk and all that stuff's going to get huge, but you're still a Bears fan at the end of the day. Oh yeah. I'm about to watch every single game and, uh, that's really just how it's been my whole life. <laughs> and we're going to have a hilarious, there's a hilarious bear story. And I love the fact that this show should live and exist for exactly that. And we shouldn't, you know. Yeah. And I think I like, I've seen people get a little, maybe not upset, but people like, Oh, what the fuck? You guys can't get the four of you in one studio. You do one show, but it's like, dude, people got a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. Like you just launched a new show. Um, you know, Dave's bopping around. Dave is the fucking b- biggest reality TV star we got at this company. So there, <laughs> he's see getting, that. yeah, he's getting pulled in right. every show. He's getting you're discovering America. You know, Chief's doing twisted histories. He's cranking out, uh, you know, different type of content. And I mean, that's just the way it is. Right. Like you know, we'll always be here to talk sports, and that's and it's going to continue to grow, dude. Yeah. Like, and you know, people have heard the news that Dan's going to come back to Chicago at some point, mm-hmm. and there's going to be bigger mix that's going on in Chicago. And sure, maybe Redline Radio isn't the four of us in a closet anymore, you know, like lambasting over third down conversion rates and stuff. Um, To a certain extent, we're taking advantage of the opportunities that are in front of us. And we've worked hard to get here. Like, yeah, I I have to make I want to make the show with Jake work. I would like that's absolutely a priority is to get a baseball vertical launched with this guy and get him in. Because pe- the more you get to know him, is it's it's really it's been so far it's been a good show, and I think it's going to get better. I'm interested in putting time. I understand it's going to take time away from stuff we built, but the only reason I get a chance to do that show is because we've done this show for so long, mm-hmm. and I don't think the show is going anywhere. The the quality is compromised, which is why an argument like Dave last week should help us in the long run. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, regardless, it's, we could get into the fucking. I'm getting smoked on line right I now. I know. <laughs> but, You're getting – see, here's the, the funny thing about all this is Dave and I are, th- are fucking in each other's throats last week about this and that and you're an asshole and that doesn't even fucking register compared to the amount of shit that you're getting for leaving Stu Finer off the graphic. <laughs> I mean, I just had to deliver the message. I didn't leave him off shit. Did you vote for him? Be clear, you did. I did not. I did not. No, I'm, I'm not, saying, did you say thinks, you wanted him on the graphic with the council? Did I want him on? Did yeah, you say Steve I mean, deserved he, to be on the graphic? Um, so 
I mean, if we're talking about performance wise for people who listen to the show, sure, yeah, definitely. He was fucking hilarious. He wasn't afraid to go places that people were afraid to go to. And uh, yeah, he's fucking Stu. It was just funny. Like the guy that, the fact that the guy could follow ass eating up with fucking Empire Strikes Back back to back is just, not many people can do that. People don't have that fucking brain. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, I mean, I thought it was good. But obviously, if you're just looking at a graphic, like people would um, maybe say that he was the worst. I, I I, that's all I'm saying. But um, did you the fact that you vote three have for been him able to spawn off the graphic or on the graphic? I didn't vote. I, I You're didn't not on the vote. council. I'm not on the council. That's that's an honest to God. Uh, Tom, that's an honest to God thing. Do you believe him? That he's not on the council. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. He's, he, I saw him uh, tweet out the the text messages conversations. So I don't know. I don't know. I I think it's just a weird situation to have like three random people. They're not. They're two. They're two of the same people. And then I asked the one rotating guest. So it's Got always it. three okay. people. And then if it comes to a tiebreaker, then I got to keep asking random people. That's how the process works. That's how it's always worked. Oh, no. Don't say it's how it's always worked, pal. Council's new. In the history of the draft, the council is Well, for the last like fucking four months, I should say. And how long have we been doing the show? Probably two and a half years. A lot of months, Ed. It's a lot, yeah, but we needed a format. The format we were using wasn't working. With fucking the fucking goatee Danny choosing. Like, now well, you're throwing his facial hair under the bus. <laughs> well, Isn't that convenient? That's not under the bus. It's just a fact. He has a goatee right now. He's goatee Danny. If you're <laughs> subscribed to the show, I have a treat for you. Um, his five o'clock shadow is yeah, full wait, blown just goatee. Subscribe to our channel on YouTube for, and uh, you will be rewarded. Why would this just goatee in yeah, something? I don't think need to come in here. He's, people no. have to see this goatee. That's ridiculous. Yeah, we need a goatee. Um, and he's just like, oh, what's the big deal? Oh, he's acting like it's nothing. Yeah, it's just my five o'clock shadow. It's a he's acting like it's 1997. He's walking around with a goatee and it's a thing. We should make him walk in and just put his face on the uh, desk to and zoom in on him okay not say a word and just have people do you want to ask him to do that or like should if, we like try and sell yeah, him into doing like that? i wish like we had like you know what i mean like what are those things they chop their head off and they put them through the uh what is that called at medieval times guillotine it's not yeah. a guillotine no, that's when no? they cut their fucking head off all for one kev it's not a guillotine no are we sure a guillotine no. is when they slice your head off. That was a that was I a popular we, execution tool. That's kind of what I'm thinking of. Is Danny is Danny in the can? He might not. He might be. No, no. You're thinking about the one where you put your head in and you put your wrist in. Yeah, I think that's guillotine. And then they lock the thing over and you can't move. You're in the town square and people come up and they throw stuff at you. How is that not a guillotine? A guillotine, a guillotine is guillotine. when they cut your head off, dude. How do you not understand? How do you it? not get what the difference is? We're talking about having your head cut off. Yeah, I know. Versus. Ah, uh, no, that's not the guillotine. Here comes Danny. A guillotine would work though. To be Eddie clear. has something for you. Can we put your head in a guillotine? Put up, come over here. Like, like pretend like we're you're... talking about how guillotines work. We need someone to demonstrate. Here, get on your knees. Does mics work? Uh, no, they that don't. one's on. No, we just we just need your face. That no, one. That one works. Knees. Come on. Get we on need your, your face for a second. We need your face. Why? Why? We need... No, they, the mics. The mics work. If you want to pull one. Oh, out. they do. Okay. Yeah. Well, but yeah no, doesn't... that one doesn't. The other one does. What what I need from you is to get a guillotine in your face. We need we you're going to the guillotine right now. Yeah. Can I ask why? Because uh, we just I just want your 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 neck up to see the, you the goatee you're rocking. Okay, this is what that's about. I yes. figured. Yes. I don't know if you wanted me <laughs> chin up, decapit- chin up, buddy. Chin I don't up. know if you wanted me decapitated or you actually no, just no, want no. to see me hanging in a guillotine. No, I just want the camera to zoom in on just a head. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we Pick need your body. Ca- under which the camera table. should he? Which one? The center one. Center, Dan. How do we how do we lead to this? Uh, I don't know. We talked about slow sports week. No, oh, we, no, Dan, oh, no, 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 no. He, Eddie threw you under the bus, and no, I stood no, up no, for you. Time Thank you. No, that's bullshit. Yeah. Eddie threw you yep. under the bus, and I stood up for you. But I, I, st- I stood, I stepped in for him because look at this, look at this hospitality. Here. We, t- I t- <laughs> we talked about the poll. We talked about the poll, <laughs> and we talked about how you know how Stu got left off. I was like, well, it's the new process rather than just having goatee Danny decide <laughs> well, who no, gets left it, off. Eddie, Eddie said. And, Eddie goes. Eddie goes. We've always done it that way. We've always had a council. Is what he said. But then I said, all right, but sure, the last four months before Goatee Danny was doing it, he's like, oh, that's a shot. I was like, no, it's just factual. He has a goatee right now. That's not a shot. Listen, the goatee, so the goatee's going to be off within like the next two days. It was too much to deal with this morning. I have to get the right <laughs> clippers in order. I want everyone to know that I didn't shave it into a goatee. This is just how my facial hair grows. I can't grow a beard. That's crazy. Second off, when Eddie sent me that video last night to post, it was like, 
a doctor giving bad news to the waiting room. Yeah, you know, I, I, you were you felt bad for me, and I, I, I actually I appreciate that. So I, you, no guillotine for you. Appreciate it. Don't I, worry. No about one wanted. Me. No, you guys are putting him in a guillotine. I didn't ever suggest he puts him in a guillotine. No. Well, if you're talking about snake draft, though, I will say, you know, there's a lot of replies under that tweet. We have yet to have someone who got the reply for treatment win. But is it possible you're right now? You're telling me? Oh, Anything's oh my worse. God! Let's get that track? going. Let's get that going. I thought that was just like a what a storyline. I didn't even know you can like keep track of that. Oh yeah, the old it's hard to keep counting track on of. fingers. Good what thing we got? We got intern Kevin here. We got just kidding. Yeah, I want to. I want to read actually what you sent me. Um, Kevin's so, a Virginia Tech guy. I know. Take notes. I, made, I made the video. He's got an all-time nickname, Dito. Ugh. Dito. Oh wow! What are you That's just, his last name. Like, like oh, really? Like from Stan? I thought it was Dito from Stan. Made, Isn't that Stan? The T's got no, cold. He, he made it a point to say that it's not. Oh yeah, no, not, not to be confused not with the Ditto? feature on Stan. Okay, because she pronounces it Ditto, right? Yeah. He goes, uh, I legit feel bad for you. I said, horrible. I'm gonna get killed. He said, yeah, maybe stick to Facebook tonight. Ooh, what does that mean, Facebook? You're, just, you're our social guy. I yeah, feel like that's a little Facebook. disparaging to yeah. our Facebook community. No, he just, because Twitter is where he gets all the heat. No one's going to be talking shit to him on Facebook. Not yet. Yeah, maybe not yet. We could turn that real quick, Ed. I didn't post the, <laughs> I didn't post the left off video on Instagram yet, so maybe I'll Let's, do that right we gotta, now. We, we got to introduce Facebook to, to Red Ed. Maybe we should. What if we just went if all like in on world. Facebook? No, fa I don't want nothing to do with Facebook. <laughs> well, no, I, yeah, Facebook. We should is, have Facebook month at Barcelona, Chicago. We just all we do is promo yeah, stuff on. Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. oh, like the guys are dark on Twitter. Haven't seen a post from Chief in a while. It's like, <laughs> no, dude, we're just Facebook heavy this month. I feel like Facebook's gotten scary. I'd you love feel to stay way? in chat. But Terrifying. I'm done oh. crouching. Oh, it's all right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you. your. Hold on. Hold on. Did we get enough? Go see. It was. It was on his. Uh, mouth the entire time, not even his face. All so, right, yeah. there you go. Hey, squat down a little more. Let's get a little better posture. Head up. Come on, that's like, a promo, dude. Like a, like a four point stance. We're trying to do football. TikTok. Help us TikTok. There's <laughs> a goatee. There's a goatee trend on TikTok. No, they're that not. Just goatees are not making the algorithm right now. But thank you. I'll, are see, you I'll sure? talk to you guys later. See you on All right, thanks, man. Appreciate it, guys. At Danny, give him a round of applause, everybody. Thank you. Um, so we could get the guillotine thing settled. There's a 7 p.m. showing tonight at Medieval Times, and with that is complimentary access to their um, their museum that documents a series of medieval tools and torture. I fucking love Medieval Times. We kept, you kept saying we were going to do that. We have to I didn't say. I suggest this is how this group works. I'm like, we should do this. Here's a good time. Here's some dates. Here's the tickets. They said they'll approve it. And then it just it's like a fucking because everyone's all over the place like we established at the top of the show it's sad the boys You're don't have time. it's sad the boys don't have time for me it's, time it's it's it is i agree june's more busy than football season right now I, it's really, honestly crazy. It's crazy i thought we were going to slow down yeah, it's going to get worse yeah not complaining it's fun no job great job everybody loves this job yes we love smile it, new, it's busy new winter shout out to kfc radio coming in town more next help. week we got studios what? booked from fucking sundown to sunset it's going to be a great week Excited to have them. Oh, good promo, um, Ed. Why don't we keep it rolling with the promo? Oh, we should Let's talk stay about, commercial. Yeah, well, we should talk about uh, if you're going to Medieval Times, before you go to Medieval Times, just stop at Innovative Care. Why? Why? Because uh, if you need ADHD medication, uh, we all know it's a total headache. It's time to switch to Innovative ADHD. Innovative is a real medical clinic, not one of those online-only refill services. They're based here in Chicago, and these are medical providers you can trust. You'll definitely want to use them for your ADHD management. But you can also turn it innovative for other things related to primary care or urgent care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nobody has time for extra doctor visits. Simplify your ADHD management with Innovative. After your initial appointments, you can see your provider virtually through telemedicine. Telemedicine visits save you time. Get online, get your med medication refill, and get back to your life. Innovative ADHD accepts insurance for evaluations and medication refills. Uh, guys, that's critical, you know, especially, you know, you must be a resident of Illinois. They take insurance, like we are just saying. Um, you know, it's dignity and it's compassion. The providers are compassionate and kind. They're going to remove the frustration from your ADHD management. It's easy to get appointments and refills with innovative ADHD. Go they to, really are. Yeah. They really, I mean, I, I've gotten multiple COVID tests from them mm. and it's smooth process, very nice. Kind Emails follow up. Yep. Yep. It's just, and if you have questions, you know, they're there for you guys. So go mm -hmm. to innovativeadd.com and sign up. Must be a resident of Illinois. They take insurance, unlike most other companies that do this. Yep. That's important. Innovativeadd.com. Go do it. Um, all right. Anything, Cubs? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Um, all right. Two guys. 
and I talked on Bleacher Bum TV, which is like a, a, a an intentional, fun weekly Tuesday morning series that uh, you know we're putting together around the neighborhood with some friends of the the office and the show. Um, and I highlighted a couple guys this week. I do want to zero in on two on Redline Radio and remind people to subscribe to the YouTube channel. This is growing. We're we are on pace for a plaque before I die. Oh, Tom just rolled his eyes. Thanks, dude. We'll get there. Real we're confidence fucking, builder, Tommy. We're bootstrapping. I mean, dude, we just got ours for uh, Day Portnoy Show. Hundred thousand? Yeah, we just got <sighs> it. I want it here. That's we a need big more subscribers. Move. We do. We need to get fifty k. We have a good channel. The fucking stuff's yeah, funny. I know. I mean, there's it's, daily content, legitimately. Like three videos coming out yeah, daily, yeah, and the stool scenes lot. thing's great. Yeah, the stool scenes this week was unbelievable. By the way, yes. The the uh, we got clips up there too. If you don't want to watch the whole episodes, you know yeah. we got uh, you know. And we got a fresh got body here to help with it best too. Of. Mm-hmm. So I introduced you. If I get you know, mm-hmm. so it's good. Rebuilded. It's good. Yeah, we got Not some good. episodes up there. So I talked on Bleacher Bum TV. We did a little man on the street stuff too. Went around talked to some Cardinals Cubs fans. You know, obviously the sentiment around Round Wrigley was not happy. People are not happy with Tom. They they think the players aren't good enough. And I, I understand the sentiment strongly if you watch him play. The starting pitching is not great. And um, you know, there's tons to get into if you want to be nitty gritty and critical. And what I've kept going back to with this season is like just try and enjoy it. And you know, if you have time to watch one full game, sit down and watch a full game. You don't have, you know, and if you're, it's not the type of team where you need to be checking the box scores in the morning and be living and dying with the standings and stuff. It's it's kind of more of a convenience team this year, which is how it was for a very long time with the Cubs. And, you know, and then we got good and people got in that mode where it was like, what are we doing? What's this and that? What's the trade deadline? We can extend these guys. And to be honest, it's an unwind season. And now people said, and here's where I'm going to make this big jump, because people said like, oh, they should have gone and spent more money. They're mad and all this stuff. Here's a name for you. Do people like Christopher Morrell right now? He's electric, Of course, huh? of course, yeah. Reach base safely in all 21 games he's played. 20 starts, 11 of them in center field. Seven at second base, one at third, one at short. Versatility, league minimum. Sign the guy for $800,000 as a 16-year-old player. You're telling me if they go out and they get they get Correa and they sign other guys we don't know about? Now, I'm not saying Christopher Morrell is going to save the season, but you need fucking 10 Christopher Morrell. You need guys knocking on the door – trying to steal playing time to build this organization back up to a situation where year after year you can run a team out there that can compete with the top of the league, which is the Dodgers and the Mets now and the Yankees, and you see how good these teams are. The Cubs are so far behind. This is the most frustrating part for me, though, and I know you'll 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 understand, I think, is like when the Cubs are in these situations or any team when your team is rebuilding or, you know, going through a reshuffle or whatever, is like you just never know who to get excited for. Like we've seen Junior Lake. Like we've seen <laughs> fucking you know obviously Frankie Schwindel and Wisdom, and it's just I you know is is he one of those or do I actually got to divide my attention to him? No, I think you, you know can en- I think you can enjoy him right now and just be optimistic and just see kind of where it goes. Mm-hmm. And we're in a point where like there are no stakes. So it does it, if he's great and he turns out to be a legit stud that we can then like you know extend and have guys around. That's awesome. And if he isn't. Then what's the expense? It's been a, it's been a good it's been a good run so far, and we'll watch them fizzle out. And we'll wait for the next guy, and sooner or later, you just hope that enough of these guys are up there knocking, making noise, and it's like, all right, we catch on with this one, we catch on with this one. Another example: Patrick Wisdom. Um, you know, like he has proven to be a legitimate major league power hitter that can hit you know fifth or sixth in a lineup and do f- damage. And be a guy you can't make mistakes over the plate, which is what a, every major league lineup needs. You don't need nine of them. But you absolutely need at least one of those dudes in the line if you can't make a mistake to. Is Patrick Wisdom on this team or in this situation if the Cubs are still dragging it out with Bryant Rizzo? And no. Now, I'm not saying they're going to go win a bunch of World Series because of Patrick Wisdom. But, okay, if you get him at third base and now you've got a player in Morrell and you start sprinkling this around and you can be like, all right, we're going to build it. Now you have a stable of guys. And then going and hitting the free agent market makes more sense because you have a sense of what you have to play with. But after they unloaded their players – and you're kind of doing a reset on the farm system. Like it's crazy that you would go into an offseason and then commit eight years to one of these positions. Because it's the availability of the position too that lets you be the, you know, with your flexibility, your development. You know, we got a couple short stops we're gonna take a look at. Everybody had their eyes on Brendan Davis. He just had a back surgery. He's probably out for a long time in that he was top twenty prospect that just go ahead and mark that down to top two hundred now. So there's some things, you know, it's like 
just try and enjoy if you get a chance to watch a game and grill some dogs and like sit down and have a couple beers with your buddy and just like watch a Cubs game like that's kind of where I'm at with this team and you're looking for these compelling storylines to follow so if you get a chance the other guy I want to talk about was Caleb Killian so if you get a chance to watch him pitch it's cool like that's that's an opportunity I'm like all right Killian's pitching this is the guy we got in the Chris Bryant trade we got two players one was Killian and the other is this big outfielder that hits bombs and he's a couple of years away from being a consistent player. So now it's like, all right, well, we traded KB. KB went and signed a massive deal with the with the Rockies. So now we get to watch Caleb Killian pitch. Shows 97 with sync. He's got a good cutter. He's a two-pitch guy. Historically, you'd be nervous about that. But Kevin Gossman, we talked on starting nine about this. You can succeed with two pitches. There's you can succeed with two pitches as a big leaguer. There's there's sub stories here. So can he succeed as a two-pitch pitcher as a big leaguer? Are they gonna make him a third pitcher? Is that still a fucking thing? Are the Cubs you know, are they more of an advanced team now and how they're looking at their starting pitcher and their bullpen depth? There's all these cool things if you want to get into it and follow that. Or you could be more casual and just be like, oh, I hope they win a game or fucking mark a game to go sit in the bleachers with the boys. The tickets are cheap. We talk about game time. They didn't buy ad reads, but I'll tell you, the tickets are cheap. You can go up and have fun. So I guess this is kind of like my long-winded way of saying, like my message for the cut. We're checking in here mid-June. They're 13 and 13 over their last 26. They're competing. They got a cool East Coast road trip going on. They got fucking spanked by the Orioles. They got three at Yankee Stadium coming up. I mean, who doesn't have time to watch one of those games? Yeah, I mean, you're yeah. right. And you're, you're going to want to go to games this summer, so there might as well be something that you enjoy or take from it. So right, that's just all there is to it. Now, where do you – how do you feel after I just did that little fucking thing there? Uh, it's very hollow. It's very – it's very – you know, you're, 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 you're picking at things to uh, – kind of be except but i can't but there's there's not many other options you have besides be realistic it's that or it's you're gonna be mad and you're gonna scream at todd ricketts and it's like or a tom ricketts sorry there is a todd too uh and it's like i don't like it it is what it is right there's gonna be days to do that there's gonna be days to have this kind of attitude and um this is where you're going what you're going with today and i'm fine with it yeah i mean i think you know i could be mad and i don't say that as a bad thing I'll, i'm just saying like it's sure. the truth like, you know. Sure. So here's a perfect example. They play five games against Cardinals. They have opportunity to go four and five or four out of five against them. They jump up in the standings. You get excited all shit. They lose two extra inning games they absolutely should have won, where the win probability clearly favored them in, in extras. And they didn't win. And it's a situation where you're like, I know I absolutely can be mad about this, but I know enough not to be mad about this. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, over 162, the Brewers starting pitching is unbelievable. Yeah. So, like, what is the goal? Is the goal to eke out a wild card? Because then you have to make short-term sacrifices. And then you then you start fucking with the next year and the year after that and the year after that. So it is it is more about being realistic with the Cubs, which is less fandom. I'm This is probably my weakest fandom because I'm not like, let's beat their ass. You know, I thought the Bulls, like, all right, yeah, let's we can, we can fucking steal this. Yeah. I don't know shit. Mm -hmm. I know too much about this to be like, Rah, rah, hit a home run. Yeah, like, yeah. That home run ain't coming. And I'm going to take very similar situation with the Bears this year. So, And I think that that's actually has been an existing thing with me. Probably. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's the reality of having one team who, I mean, you'd think that the Sox figure out at some point. And then another team who, we'll see what they do in the offseason with the Bulls. That's that's the reality of having three teams in the, uh, in the gutter and then two teams that are it's kind of ready to compete. So, mm -hmm. so I'm just they just stay as stay as optimistic. But here's the thing: if they rattle, if they start getting hot, then then I'm sucked. You know, they win six out of seven. I'm right back. Like, totally. All right, wait a second now. Wait a second. Stroman hasn't pitched well. Hendricks hasn't pitched well. Wade Miley's coming back. Smiley hasn't been sharp. You know, now we're really uh, Keegan Thompson pitched bad. He's gonna bounce back. So I'm willing to get sucked in. Right. Always willing to get sucked in. Right. Fuck, man. Always. Uh, speaking of sucked in, we have a second here. Tom, 2-2 two, two Rangers. You want to give us an update? Our producer, Tom, is a diehard Rangers fan. We We've should. been sharing for him. But before we do, I want to talk about MLB in their truck. Yeah. ML, the official truck of Major League Baseball is actually Chevy. Is it Chevy? Yeah, did you know that? No, I didn't know that. Yeah, Chevy, Chevy, Chevy is a great product. And the dealers around Chicago can help you with your service needs. Okay. Go to Chicago Chevy. Go to ChevyDriveChicago.com. What's also cool, too, is they want to uh, give you a chance to uh, sail Chicago this year. That's right. This summer, your local Chicagoland and Northwest Indiana Chevy dealers are giving away multiple boat charters with Tailgate the Lake. I mean, 
You want to you want to go on a boat? Yeah, I mean it's always fun. It's just, like I was I saw this before on a different Chicago and Chevy. I'd read. I never know how to do that. You know what I mean? Like it's like oh, if I don't know someone, I feel like I can't do it. There's ways to do it. I know there's ways to do it, and this is the way that I know right now, and that's going to ChevyDriveChicago.com. Uh, all you have to do to enter to win is the uh, the sweepstakes is go to that website. Yeah, Chevy Sales Chicago. Okay, so here we it's go. Pretty sweet. They should put a. Uh, they should just like have a fleet and just bring a bunch of Colorados and Silverados and shit onto the lake and just have people fucking yep. chilling in them. I am. Uh, I'm on there right now. You're you're entering. I'm entering. Look at this, a live entering people. Here it is. You go to Chevy Drive Chicago opening banner. It's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm clicking. I don't know. Slamming the keyboard. Personal keys. information. Barstool. Carl. Uh oh, man. And have you ever seen a live info dump like this? I don't think I ever have. This is first of its kind. Are we on the clock? How long is this taking me, Tom? Uh, probably 25 seconds in. Okay. My unofficial math time. This is a, a proof of concept here to show people that it doesn't take that long. You're using your real name here, right? Not Turd Ferguson. We are entered. We're entered? It we took that entered. long. For a chance to uh, sail Chicago, go do it. ChevyDriveChicago.com. Um, and yeah. I was distracted, too, while I was doing that. Mm -hmm. you, you could not. You could probably do it in 15 seconds or less. Probably. Kevin, what do you think? We're going to put you on the timer when the show's over. He says 10. Beautiful. Tune Beautiful. in next week to find out if he did 10 or not. <laughs> All right. I think we should get to Hawk Harrelson. I think we should get to Hawk Harrelson. Mm -hmm. Does that sound good to you? It sounds great to me, Ed. All right. Should I give the whoosh or should you? It's always weird whooshing without Dave. Um, it's like when you guys bang, bang without me there. What do you think? You whoosh. 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 All right. We're in the interview portion of today's show. We are joined by a legend. Voice of White Sox fans, childhood, my childhood, have learned more about the game of baseball. You and Steve Stone will talk about it in a moment, but I got something for you. I've been waiting to do this a long time. I know you like to turn vodka into piss, <laughs> so here's a nice little bottle of Grey Goose. You can do as you please with it. Um, that's my gift from myself and White Sox fans to you for all you did for us over almost 40 years. How, how long was it? In the booth, uh, all together, I, I was uh, announcing for 42 years. 42? Yes. I started off with Boston for seven years. And then uh, an interim there, I was with the Yankees for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. I came back to the White Sox in 82 and Drysdale, and I were here. So I was with 30, uh, 34 years with the White Sox. Wow. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. It's been a lot of fun. I don't like how he cut me out of that nice gesture. Well, it's like this is from him only in White Sox fans. I'm like, I'm sitting right here. But he describes you. Here, you want to see yeah, well, hey, well, I mean, if you turn wait, it up a little bit. It's 1030. That's yeah. not too early. Yeah. If we were on the golf course right now, I'd be cracking a beer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that's the champions of the breakfast, you know, a hot dog yeah. and a beer. Oh, yeah. Breakfast of Champions. That's how uh, you guys used to hit all those dingers and everything, right? You do. Did you, did you sit in a weight room ever, or were you just all natural farm boy strength, South Carolina, Georgia farm boy? I was always strong. Yeah. And uh, I was big for my age. In fact, <coughs> excuse me, um, when I was a sophomore, I went to military school for three years. And when I was a sophomore, we went to play in the uh, – Basketball tournament in Atlanta, Georgia Tech Coliseum, and somehow or another they had me listed uh, as a senior, and I got an offer to go to Georgia Tech to play basketball. <laughs> when I was a sophomore. <laughs> they sent a letter to my school Benedictine there in Savannah, you know. So it's been uh, it's been quite a ride. I had a great mom. Uh, right. I didn't even know my dad, and I didn't want to. Mm -hmm. Uh. She was something. She worked her behind off, uh, single parent, made 56 bucks a week. I was making more going to high school than she was in her job because, you know, I'd score 30 or 40 points in a basketball game, and here come the alumni with here's a yeah. five, here's a <laughs> yeah. 10, here's a 20, you know. And then in baseball, uh, I get I had one guy there who gave me a, a dollar for every RBI, and uh, – 
uh, $5 for a home run. And I drove in almost 100 runs. We played a lot of games. I don't. I never figured out how guys in the Midwest and in the North ever got to the big leagues because they never played. You couldn't. Yeah. You know, the mm-hmm. rain and the cold. And I got two grandsons. That's the reason we moved up. We built a home here. We have a home in Orlando. And we come up to see our grandsons play. And uh, it, it's just amazed me all these years. I still don't understand it. That's the only reason why Dave didn't make the majors. <laughs> yeah, that is why if I would have grew up in yeah. Savannah, so, Georgia, <laughs> South Carolina, it probably would have been a big league. Yeah, but if you, that and maybe six more inches of height, and he's right there. <laughs> maybe eight, nine inches, but yeah. Um, but you had mentioned um, – your upbringing a little bit and in your mom and you talk about it a lot in your book. Now this book is your first way, what you described as multiple copies or, or versions or what are, do you have a, a new book in the works? Or are you just hanging out? What's Hawk up to these I've days? I've had some people call me to do a, a new, another book. Mm-hmm. And this is the second one. I did one back in 19 and after I was player of the year and, uh, in 68, uh, I did one in 69. Okay before I went to, to Cleveland. And uh, I've had some people call and wanted me to do another book, but it's not going to be, it won't be much different than this one because of the fact I'm not a kiss and tell guy. You know, <laughs> right. it's just, uh, I don't Can, believe in all that stuff. we get you to uh, retract that policy for the rest of this interview? We want, <laughs> we want exclusively kiss and tells the rest of this interview. Well, there, there's, I was telling him on the way out here, so I read it in a, in a, a day or so, and, and, when we've talked to AJ Pierzynski, for instance, uh, we we brought you up, and this was a while back, but he Dennis described the you, menace. <laughs> that, oh, big time Dennis the menace. <laughs> That's right. But he described you as the, like the real life modern day version of Forrest Gump. And if you read your autobiography, you really are. Now, you met Frank Sinatra out in Los Angeles, I believe. Yeah, we had a golf tournament out there every year, in, uh, Palm Springs, and a uh, baseball players tournament. And they had a, all the movie stars. Mm-hmm. In fact, uh, my first two rounds, the first round I played with Clint Eastwood, and uh, then I played with, uh, oh, I forget his name. Uh, but they were big, big stars yeah. out there. Mm-hmm. And we had a great time, you know. And then Sinatra was there, and he joined us one day. We were sitting around telling lies, you know, and having some cocktails. <laughs> and, so he comes over, sits down, and I tell you, when he walked in a room, Everything stopped. Oh, yeah. It was like, I mean, it was like, whew, froze. Everybody was yeah. frozen. Like God watched. Yeah, exactly yeah. right. Yeah. You know, yeah. well, not maybe that. But <laughs> close. <laughs> and then the next time I saw him was down in Miami when Junior, when Frank Junior was doing a show down there at a friend of mine's uh, cabaret. And uh, I was sitting there and uh, I didn't have my beautiful greek wife with me we weren't married yet i didn't know her and i had a date with me and so all of a sudden here comes frank walking in with his entourage must have been eight or ten people so he sits down maybe 15 feet from me and Mm -hmm. then all of a sudden i gotta go to the little boy's room so i get up and i'm I'm not gonna you know say hi frank or anything you know so i get up and i'm walking by and all of a sudden he grabbed me by the arm he looked up he says you don't say hello to your friends. <laughs> I melted. Oh, yeah. What do you do there? The hawk became a pigeon. <laughs> I'll tell you. He was so he was just a great guy. And uh we had we had so much fun uh, in those golf outings back in those days, you know, and it, it was uh what was it like out on those on those golf outings? Was there money changing hands? Or who, oh yeah. Uh, who who was like the most fun to play with. Who was the best? Uh, I was the best. You were the best. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You right. qualified for the British Open. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, Nicholas talked me into that. Jack, and, uh, after I retired from baseball, I went down to – I was living in Miami Beach. And a friend of mine and his dad owned the St. Louis Blues, St. Louis Blues, a hockey team. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sid Solomon, and uh, they owned a little, uh, small hotel there. And they had three penthouses – and they gave me one of the penthouses to, to live in. So, you know, it was just unbelievable. And then uh, I was going, I was a member at Lagorce and I was going out and Jack and I were, Jack was a member there too because Jack Grout was his teacher. 
And Jack Nicholas and I were playing a lot of golf together. So uh, I'll never forget, I was playing really good. I mean, I was shooting anywhere from 64 to 70 every day, you know, and uh, this is in 72. And this is the year that Jack was going for the Grand Slam. Mm -hmm. And so we uh, uh, we were going to play that morning before lunch. And he's on the tee, and I walk up and and I was, as I said, I was playing good. And I looked at Jack and I said, Jack, I'm going to kick your ass today. And he looked at me and he smiled and he says, you just hold that thought because you won't have it long. <laughs> <laughs> did you ever, did you have it long? He was right. Uh, yeah. 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 Did, you never took any money off of holes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he, uh, he says, you ought to go over and try to qualify. He says, you're playing too good. So I went over and I played really good. I shot 138 for two days. I shot 70-68. And let all American qualifiers wow. in some, you know, some tough weather. And then, uh, what course was it on? We, it was we qualified at Galane, which is a sister course to Muirfield, okay. where they were holding okay. the open. Yeah. Yep. And uh, so uh, the day they started tournaments over there on Wednesdays because they didn't play on Sunday. Oh. So uh, Tuesday night we went out and we had dinner, all of us together. And, and uh, so I w went to the golf course the next morning. And so Jack comes walking and he says, who are you playing with today? I said, I'm not playing. He says, what? I said, I'm not playing. Jack, I can't hit any better than I'm hitting it. I said, you know, in that little redhead last night at the, uh, <laughs> at the restaurant and going back to, to meet her and he goes, bleep. Uh, I said, I said, that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> you know, and he, he says, come on, you're going to play with me. So we, uh, he says, you and I are going to play NC and Weisskopf. And Weisskopf is playing so good, it's just unbelievable. And he said he shot uh, 64 yesterday, he shot 30 the day before, nine holes. And uh, he said, I just want to see what happens the first time you hit it by him. So now I know what my job is. Yeah. Right? So I said, okay, I had my caddy bring the clubs back out and we walk over. First, uh, the first tee there at Muirfield is, I don't know, 70, 80 yards from the clubhouse. And it must have been 15, 20,000 people there to see Jack because he's going for the Grand Slam. Yep. And we walk over there. So they got the honors and Yancey gets up and he has a little shit shot out there to the right, you know, in the rough. And then uh, Weisskopf just, Absolutely barbecued one right down the middle. And first hole at Muirfield's a long dogleg right, par four. So Jack's talking with uh, the media. But while we were walking over there, he says, look, don't say anything about this. He said, but Barb and I were playing tennis last night. And I got a crick in my neck and I can't turn. And you can't play golf or baseball or anything where I got a crick. Yeah, you right. can't drive with, yep. a, you know, with a crick. And so uh, he says, go ahead and hit. And I get up, I'm nervous. You know, like when you're getting ready to get in the fight, your knees are shaking yep. and everything. And I just killed it on the same line <laughs> as Weisskopf. So Jack gets up. And this is one of the best athletic things I've ever seen. Here's a man who couldn't had a crick in his neck and couldn't turn. And he hit a little shit shot out there with Yancey over in the right rough. And, and – there's two balls on down there, uh, and Weisskopf just goes right to the front ball. So I walked to the, my heart went, you know, I'm broken. So I walk up and I looked at Jack, I said, they ain't mine. He goes like this. So he waited about 15, 20 seconds, you know, and he said, hey, Weiss, you going to play today or not? <laughs> <laughs> so he, Weisskopf walks over to that front ball. He comes storming back. Now, the only time I ever met Tom Weisskopf was when we met on that tee. We shook hands. Mm -hmm. After that, we never he never said a word to me that in 18 holes. <laughs> so you <laughs> drove him once yeah. and that was it. Yeah. <laughs> and Jack, Jack, top, top American amateur. <laughs> Jack looked at me after he hit, and he said, now I want to see the next fairway he hits. <laughs> <laughs> he started coming out of his shoes, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, slicing everything, yeah. pulling everything. So you, so you were, you guys were a team. Like oh, you yeah. got in his head, and then Jack was able to play with his. And, you know, Jack, 
I called some friends of mine back in Boston uh, that night, and uh, I told them, I said, Jack's in trouble. I said, I don't even think he can make the cut because he didn't play very well, mm -hmm. hit it very well in that practice round we had. And uh, that was on a Tuesday, so he didn't have yeah. much time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't you know, he somehow made the cut, and then the last day he shoots 66, and Trevino had two give-up chip-ins. The last one on seven, number seventeen, and and he beat Jack by a shot. Oh wow! The one that and I tell you what, that was one of the greatest athletic uh, achievements I've ever seen in my whole career, in basketball, football, baseball. It didn't make any difference. Mm -hmm. He played eighteen holes in pain. Yeah, you can't do yeah. any. You can't sleep. You can't do anything can't, with exactly a right. tight neck. And he's uh, people. And then he. Uh, He was such a – people don't understand. He was a good athlete. Jack Nicholas mm -hmm. was a heck of an athlete. And Arlen and I butted his for 40 years. You know, I mean, we have a home there on 17th Tee there at Bay Hill. And Arnold and I had a great time. And between those two guys, I'll tell you what, I had some – You played some two wonderful of the all-time greats. Yeah. Did you uh, – yeah. how much money are you into them for? Huh? How much money would you say you're into them for? Oh, I tell you what, I um, I won't tell you a story I shouldn't tell you, but I'm going to tell it. Good. <laughs> we like this. <laughs> I was playing really good, and I was killing Arnold, just beating him every day. You know, I was shooting anywhere from 62 to 68 every day there at Bay Hill. Mm -hmm. And we played all the way back. We didn't play, you know, okay. back to from, You're from the tips. Yeah. All the way back. Okay. So – I get in my cart and I drive over to have breakfast one morning and Winnie comes walking out of the uh, restaurant there at Bay Hill and she comes up to me. She says, Hawk, she says, when are you going to let Arnold win? <laughs> so I laughed, you know. She says, no, I'm serious. It's killing him. She said, he'd rather beat you than win a, a senior event. <laughs> <laughs> so I go in and have breakfast, drive back. To the house and i told my wife eris my beautiful greek wife and i uh, of almost 50 years congratulations wow. and um i told her i said arnold's gonna win today she said what are you talking about and i told her what when he had said you know so eris didn't say anything i didn't let him win hell he shot like 63 or 64 that day so the next morning i get in my cart and i drive down to have breakfast again when he comes walking out, and she grabs him. Oh, Hawk, thank you so much. I said, are you happy now? You know, <laughs> I went right along with it. I said, are you happy now? She says, yeah. I said, why? Did you get lucky last night? She says, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we have had uh, Oral, I'll tell you, he was our John Wayne. Yeah. He really was. He's larger than life kind that of guy. That man, you know, we in all the years we played together and all the I never saw him refuse one autograph. I never saw him refuse one picture. Yep. The only other guy I've ever seen like that was Cal Ripken Jr. Hmm. Cal Ripken would get out 15 or 20 minutes before they took batting practice. And he'd go behind the cage and he would have it roped off and he would sign autographs, sign autographs, sign autographs. Rocky Colavito was another guy who signed them all. He got Rocky. We were at Kansas City, and um, in fact, this is the first game that I wore the batting gloves. And and we, I was platooning. I was a kid, and I was platooning. And uh, so the Yankees were in town, and they were going to pitch us. Uh, uh, they were pitching Whitey Ford's what they were doing. Okay. So I was going to play that night, and then they switched. And they were going to pitch a uh, hearts one right hand named Jim Coates. Well, now I'm in the lineup, and I didn't know I was there. Morning of, and yeah. I had played 27 holes of golf that day <laughs> with Ted Bosfield, and I played Gino Simoli and Sammy Esposito. I made more money playing golf, shooting pool, and arm wrestling than I did playing baseball because the minimum salary was six thousand dollars. <laughs> Today it's seven hundred thousand. Now it's yeah. seven, yeah, no. yeah which I'm happy for the guys. But uh, I remember I had a, a blister, and I, I remember to have my golf glove up in the uh, 
No kidding. You know, in my jeans. So the game starts, and they switched back to Whitey Ford. And Whitey hung me a curveball, and I hit it right over that 423 sign out there in <laughs> Kansas City in that old ballpark. And then I hit one later on in the game, and I had this flaming red golf glove on. So the next day, we go to the ballpark, and here come the Yankees walking out on the field, and all of them had flaming red golf gloves on. <laughs> <laughs> Mickey had, Mantle had the club. He'd go out and buy a couple of dozen of those golf gloves. That's funny. And that's how the golf glove got out. The batting glove batting got glove, started. Yeah. It's a legend, dude. Right. Like, so you are in Cooperstown now, and – that I do want to get to that because we didn't get the the necessary or proper Hawk Harrelson coverage for when you did get inducted because of the pandemic. Um, like you've lived such a just a a, and I, I guess this is the word random life. Um, I mean, you invented the batting glove, and do you, has Cooperstown? Do you have your batting gloves with your plaque in there or what? Mm-mm. No? no, I mean that's that's everybody who plays baseball wears batting gloves now. It doesn't matter if you're a little leaguer, or, you know. Yeah. Do you like seeing Eloy wear the red batting gloves? No. Huh? Do you, Eloy wears those bright red batting gloves too? Does that bring you back a little bit? Do you like seeing that? Uh, I, when I think about it, I, you know, I've never, I've never kept anything no. uh, memorabilia or anything. I, I, and I've had some stuff that if I had it today. For example, I had uh, Satchel Page. The last game he pitched was against Boston. He pitched uh, three innings. He gave up one hit. That was to Jim Gosger. Okay. And uh, after the game was over, Satchel and I had become pretty good. I had talked to him every day about the Negro Leagues and everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I got to where I loved him. And then anyway, when he finished with that, I went over to him. I said, Satchel, can I have your glove? He said, sure. It was a Wilson A2000. He gave it to me. I don't know where it is. <laughs> I, I know. you. I remember reading that in the book. You, like, you lost it in the clubhouse or something. You just couldn't No, that it, right? was in 67. We were in the World Series with Red Sox. And we're going to play game seven against the Cardinals. Yeah. And I go to the clubhouse that, that morning, and my glove is gone. That's Somebody what it stole it out of my locker. It's seventh game of the World Series. Now, I'm not saying that cost us a World Series, but what happened was I had to borrow Danny Osinski's glove, which was fairly similar to mine, except mine was very pliable. It was like a sponge. Mm -hmm. And if I got my glove on it, it was caught. I mean, it was just – that was that yep. was it. So I used Danny's glove, and then in about the seventh inning – I'm playing right field, and uh, McCarver hits a low line drive, and I go in, and I and I and I was a good uh, outfielder. And in fact, the reason we got to the World Series there was because of Lon Borg. He he was just the best pitcher in all of baseball mm -hmm. that year, along with Bob Gibson, who beat us three times in, in that, that series. Yeah. Yep. But uh, McCarver hit a low line drive, and I come in and dive for it. It hits in the glove, just pops out. Two runs score. And when you give Bob Gibson, like uh, that made it a three run game. When That's you give him a three run lead, you can wrap it up. And, yeah. Yeah. You know. Was he the scariest guy you ever faced? No. No? Who was scarier or more intimidating than Bob Gibson? The best guy, the best pitcher I ever saw, I never faced because I was gone by then. Okay. And that was Roger Clemens. Okay. Okay. Clemens, the best pitcher I ever saw. Okay. I mean, you know, seven time, 20 game winner. Uh, seven-time Cy Young Award winner, mm -hmm. and me. And he was as big as that door over there. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's, his shoulders were yeah. that wide. And, and um, in fact, he, he when they have the Arnold Palmer Invitational there in Bay Hill, he always comes over to the house, you know, mm -hmm. and we sit around and tell some lies and, you know, and have a few cocktails. I like that expression, sit around and tell some lies. Yeah. <laughs> Em embellishments but, yeah uh, yeah well you know the home runs get longer and, <laughs> yeah. yeah of course i hit that ball 470 or those 92 mile hour fastballs all of a sudden 103 yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> well hawk i feel like these aren't even lies i feel like you just have the most absurd stories and they're all true yeah. and it's like who needs that memorabilia you got all the memories so yeah. and if memorabilia makes you stick to the facts a little bit well, so. how, many, how many times have you been on air force one 
Huh? How many times have you been on Air Force One? One. It was one. I thought I thought I remember like four presidencies or something. No. Who, one. who took you on Air Force One? Uh, Ed Farmer. <laughs> Farmio got rest his soul. Yeah. Okay. I love that guy. Yeah. We all. What a him. what a great man he was. I'll tell you one thing right now. He was one of the meanest guys. He was a two for one guy. You hit one of his guys, he's gonna get two of yours. Mm-hmm. Love that. Yes. And Drysdale was like that too. Drysdale started that two for one club, you know, with pitchers. And um, Stan Williams was another guy. In fact, Steamer, who's got to rest his soul, see, I'm, I love all these guys I'm talking about mm-hmm. now. They're gone. Yeah. You know. <laughs> and, uh, do you, do you think baseball misses that a little bit? Like that, uh, the two for one or, you know, like pitchers standing up policing themselves? Do you wish there was more of that in the game today? Yeah, Contact. I do. Yeah, yeah, I do. I, I, I believe in the codes that we yeah. had to play by. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if we had a seven or eight run lead, you know, in the seventh inning, uh, you didn't steal a base. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. and you didn't swing three and oh. Okay. You know, it yep. was it was like that. These I don't blame these guys, the players. Mm-hmm. I blame the agents. Uh, baseball today has turned into an agents game. You know, uh, I think the combined salaries of Scott Boris Stable last year was a billion two hundred million. It's a little bit of money. Yeah, as I said when I came in, it was uh, six thousand dollars was the minimum. And I, at one time after I became a free agent, when Finley released me uh, because I cussed him out over you know media about firing Alvin Dark and everything. Uh, I signed, I was making $12,000 then, and I signed a contract with Boston for 150000 which made me the highest paid player in baseball. Hmm. And I didn't deserve it, but it was circumstances. Right. Mm-hmm. They were in a pennant race. Tony Canigler Arrow had gone down, you know, he yeah, got hit right did. here and yep. eventually killed him. Yeah. You know, and uh, Ted Williams said Tony was the greatest young home run hitter he had ever seen. But I came in for him, and I and I did well. I, mm-hmm. you know, uh, we won the World Series. We had to beat Minnesota on a Saturday and a Sunday. We had to beat Dean Chance and Jim Cott, and both of them were Cy Young Award winners, you know. And and we did mm-hmm. because of Yastrzemski. Yastrzemski is the best player I ever saw. I mean, he's the best player I ever played with. Obviously, and Kaline said the same thing. Al. Al and I used to, when I was, we'd go in to announce the Tiger games in Detroit, I was always stopped by the booth, you know, and we'd tell some lies, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. and he said Jastrzemski was the best player he ever saw. He was my dad's all-time favorite. I'll yes. tell you, when yep. he, has, <laughs> he could do, that day with Nicholas in that practice round, mm-hmm. he couldn't, he couldn't swing. And on the 18th hole there at Muirfield, I hit it into the bunker and blasted out over the green. So they had a press going on us. And Jack had it up there about 18, 20 feet from the hole, above the hole. And it was one of these, you know. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget this. This was a a, a poignant type. Okay. He says, you want me to work on this one? I said, yeah, because I'm out of the hole, you know. I said, yeah. Only Putty worked on all day because, you know, he had to bend over, you know, and he, he didn't bend over all day except on that putt on 18. Mm-hmm. And he gets up over the putt, you know, on that cross. And he, he looks at me and goes, Hawk, that could be center cut. <laughs> Ball goes down. I mean, right it just hit the middle of that hole. And I'll never forget this. I was saying to myself, Hawk, who was my older ego, you know, if that's what it takes to be a great player, we'll never get there. <laughs> <laughs> I shot a 68 talk to today, you. but not, 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 not going to be good enough. Hey, let's take a quick break here from talking to Hawk Harrelson, and let's talk about the Game Time app. Carl, it is the exclusive ticketing partner of Barstool Sports. I tell you guys, I love Game Time. It is a phenomenal product. I used it last night to go to the Dodgers, see the Dod- my buddy plays for the Dodgers, saw them in town. I was like, he's like, hey, let me give you tickets. I said, no. Instead of you giving me tickets, I'm getting the tickets. I'm using Game Time. And there's some more. Rangers at White Sox, 610, 611, 
I think I'm going 611. It's a wine shirt day at a guaranteed rate. It's a big day for a bunch of friends of mine. They put together a group of about 100 people and they go, they're like the wine shirt, I guess. They have a lot of good wow. promotions. Yeah. Wow. And you guys are slamming the game time app. Yeah, exactly. So I haven't bought my tickets yet and I'm just going to wait because I know that the uh, price drops are crazy. I think they're $6 and dropping. So mm. make sure you check the prices live. It's the only place to get the best, cheapest, last minute tickets. If you ever dreamed of sitting in a seat you never thought you could behind home plate, first row of the outfield, catching dingers, it's all possible. With the game time app, the biggest last minute price drops can be found in the seats you thought you could never buy. Best part, you get $20 off your first purchase. So if you're going to the Hawaiian shirt, I mean, <clears throat> I'll talk about deal. I'll talk about steal. Let's talk about game time. Download the game time app, go to the account tab to create a login, redeem code RLR for $20 off your first purchase. That's pr promo code RLR for $20 off your first purchase. Purchase terms apply. Download game time last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, let's get back to Hawk Harrelson. It seems like you enjoy golf as much as baseball. Is that an accurate statement, or is it baseball? Well, golf's a tougher game than baseball <laughs> for, for you, maybe. But uh, Yaz did something that was similar to that. Mm -hmm. We're playing in the sixth game of the World Series against the Cardinals, and they bring in Joe Horner to pitch to Yaz, and I'm on deck. And there was a couple guys on, and he comes over. And he had never faced Horner, and mm -hmm. I'd faced Horner a lot in winter ball, and you know, in spring training and everything. And he comes over, and he says, "You know this guy?" I said, "Yeah." He said, "What's he got?" I said, "He's a foot quicker than he looks." He was sneaky because he came yeah. right out of here, you know, right out of here, tough to pick up the mm -hmm. ball. Didn't throw that hard, but sneaky. Yeah. See, he goes, well, I need more than that. So we went over to the dugout. And Sal Magley was a pitching coach, and he had all the information on the Cardinals uh, that Frank Malzone had scouted them, you mm -hmm. know. He said, what you got on Horner? And he goes, Ch -ch 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 -ch. Horner starts all left-handed hitters off with a low fastball to get ahead. Yes, looks at me and goes, that's what I wanted to know. <laughs> He goes back, gets in the batter's box. I go back and get her on deck circle. First pitch, Horner came out of here with a low fastball. He did, he had that sucker about 15 rows over that bullpen out there in right field. <laughs> and I'll never forget this. Like it was Jack's putt. He's going around first base, and I said, Hawk, if that's what it takes to be a great hitter, we'll never, <laughs> never get <care>. there. <laughs> Those two moments uh, yeah. were just uh, precious to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, what it does, you know, it's like – when Tiger, and I'm a big Tiger fan, mm -hmm. you, know, you can take Mickelson and stick him up your ass. <laughs> but uh, I'm a big Tiger fan. And mm -hmm. when he had that accident, I did the same thing sliding in the second base. I broke my fibula, tibia, oh. and dislocated my ankle, turned it up yeah. <laughs> upside down. That's what Tiger did. Yeah. See? And I told my wife, I said, he'll come back. Because they were talking about amputating his leg, you know. Oh, yeah, it was very scary. And, there, and I said, Tiger will come back. I said, that Tiger to me is in that category, not just ability-wise, mentally. Yeah, he's like Michael Jordan. Yeah, kind of. yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. He's, you know, if you're paired up with him, you you got to win mental warfare just as much as on the on the golf course. It's I like his like. brain is worth an intimidation is worth like yeah. three strokes in a round. Have you ever have you ever had any run-ins with him or practice rounds with Tiger? No, I never played with him. Never I played met him a couple times. Okay. He belongs to one of the clubs uh, that I belong to there. Uh, not at Bay Hill. Of course, he's won at Bay, Tail, uh, Bay Hill I think, oh, yeah. six times. Yep, he loves it there. Yeah, he belongs to uh, uh, Orange Tree. Cause he and uh, Maddox and uh, – and those guys, uh, Glavin used to come out to in spring training because they had spring training in Orlando, and mm -hmm. they'd come out to Orange Tree and play. And Tiger would come over and play with them, you okay. know. But I, I talked with Tiger one day at uh, at uh, Alworth, where he was a member, and he's, he's just he's just a solid person. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I just love the guy. I admire him. I love him. And when you're talking about great athletes, you know. And I was a great athlete. There's no question about mm -hmm. that. And uh, it just boils down to, to mentality. Mm -hmm. You, you got to have that competitive streak too. Yeah. There, yeah. That's you just hit the right word. Yep. 
competitiveness. Mm -hmm. And that's what Arnold, Jack told me that Arnold was the best competitor that he ever played against. He said the best ball striker he ever played against was Trevino. Okay. But it boils down to this. Yep. If you think you can or you think you can't, you're right either way, mm -hmm. you know. And and that's what happens with great athletes. Yes, once he got focused in on something, I mean, you couldn't get him out. Yeah. Do you think there's a guy on the White Sox today that has that level or close to it? Tim Anderson. Tim Anderson, Tim Anderson. 100%. Yeah, and uh, I was on the show, well, yesterday, as a matter of fact, back to Chicago, and they asked me, what I thought about, you know, because I had nothing but great expectations coming into this year. There was nobody in the American League had more talent than we had. Yep. I don't think so either. If they played, well, guys don't play. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. and, and I, again, I'm not blaming them. I'm blaming the agents, yep. you know, and you'd be doing the same thing, especially with pitchers. If I have throw, that, yeah. I have that with Yoel and Cotter right now, that he got paid a little bit, so he's kind of on easy street. That's what Yoan Mankata right now. Oh, yeah. It seems like he's on cruise control. Now, that's not fair for me to say necessarily because I'm just, just watching fair. him on TV. <laughs> but his body language has not been good this year. It seems like Tim Anderson, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Tim Anderson gets going. He He's on a rocket ship, you know? Well, I told him Yo yesterday Mankata, on that the uh, this radio show that I told him, I said, you know, they asked me what I – could the Sox come back after, you know, this downer period? I said – if Tim Anderson comes back, yes, we can win it. If he doesn't, we can't. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's just that. That simple. team goes just as he goes. That's that's right. Uh, Abreu is the leader of that clubhouse, and Anderson is the leader on the field. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tim Anderson is a great competitor. Yeah, and boy, I'll tell you what, he is to us what Jeter was to the Yankees. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, you're right. My God has got. Tons of talent, but he doesn't play. He doesn't. Yeah. He doesn't play. Yeah. You know, he got, he got a big base hit yesterday for, for a change. Mm -hmm. But uh, Abreu, Abreu, he's, I, I've enjoyed watching him grow because, and Tim too. Tim, when he first, his first two years in the, with us, he was the worst shortstop in, in, oh, yeah, it was in, bad. in, in baseball. Yep. And I think it was Joe McEwing got with him, and they worked, and they worked on his footwork and everything else. And now I wouldn't trade it for any shortstop in the game. You could argue he's the best shortstop in baseball right sure. now. Sure. Yeah. All around. I know he's had his defensive struggles, but those were, like, isolated to specific games, you know, three-error games. But outside of those games, he's been great defensively this year, I think. And every single year, and I know you're not a fan of all the sabermetrics and all that. I'm not really either. Um, but – all these people are saying Tim Anderson, he's going to fall back to earth. And he gets better every single every year. year. Every year. He has in, that, that fire. He's got yeah. that fire. And but like, and I know you love this as well. I When I watch him hit, he is actively trying to hit that right center gap. He's The way he works to the opposite field is smart. He's so smart in the box. He, he You know, you'll see him adjust his spacing in the batter's box and – because he's anticipating off speed and he wants to take away, you know, an extra six inches of break or whatever. Watching him hit is – it's a pleasure at this point. He's as, as heady and cerebral as a guy I've, I've he seen. He does so many things. Ted Williams and I used to talk a lot, you know, when mm -hmm. I was playing with the Red Sox. And Ted turned my career around. There's no question about that. And by that I mean – we we're talking one day, and he said, "Hawk, he says you got some of the strongest hands I've ever seen on a bat." He says, "But you don't know how to hit." And yeah. he was right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's what you're talking about, Ted. He goes, "That batter's box." He said, "That batter's box is yours. You can go anywhere in that batter's box you want to go. If you want to stand on top of the plate, or if you want to stand back in the back corner." Or if you want to stand up in front, like mm -hmm. Willie Horton used to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Willie was a match. Alex used to do that. <laughs> and it, for some reason, it registered with me. And then I boiled it down to try to beat pitchers arm side. If it's a left-hander, try to beat them. I'm a right-handed hitter. If it's a left-hander, try to beat them to right field. If it's a right-hander, I couldn't hit Jim Palmer with a tennis racket. <laughs> And after Ted talked to me, I used to move right up on top of the plate. 
I mean, this far from the plate. Mm -hmm. And I've talked to pitchers, Hall of Famers. They don't like a right-handed pitcher nope. does not like a guy, right-handed hitter standing on top of the plate. It's uncomfortable for them. They, they've got to tighten that breaking ball yep. up, you know, yep. and a slider, you know. And after Ted told me that we were playing in Baltimore, it was the first time I did it against Palmer, and Andy Etcheberrin was a catcher. And Andy says, whoa, whoa, because they, you know, they study and where mm -hmm. they know where you're supposed to be in the box standing. And all of a sudden, Palmer looks in. He says, Hawk, you better get your ass off that plate. And I told Andy, I said, you go out there and tell that son of a bitch, if he hits me, I'm going to break his arm. <laughs> and I'm in it. I know you did. I, t I, t I told Andy, you tell him I'll wait on him after the game, and I'll break his arm. After the game? You're not charging the mound? I never charged the mound one time because okay. uh, what are you going to do? I don't know. Oh, uh, hold me back? <laughs> yeah. You can't do anything. Mm -hmm. I used to wait to the guy. If I was that upset with a pitcher, I'd wait till after the game. I'd go to this clubhouse, wait for him to come out, and then I'd beat the shit out of him. <laughs> that happened? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How many, all right, so then how many fights did you get that are off the field, so they're just assault? So how many fights did you get in after a after game? a game or in your career? Probably six, seven. Six different fights. What was like the most memorable? Like, what was the angriest you were at a pitcher, and and why? I guess was it all just like, hey, they're just brushing your back. Actually, or? it was the first time that I that I did that. I was really hot, uh, but it actually wasn't a pitcher. We were we got into a fight with uh, the Phillies farm team. I was an Olean in the New York Penn League, mm -hmm. and uh, they had a big bonus boy that we had squared off, so to speak, in, uh, in, in the fight. Mm -hmm. And I had him down on the ground and it was pounding him, you know. Okay. <laughs> and Andy Simonick was the manager and he comes over and he grabs me. He says, all right, he's had enough. So he pulls me off and I, I, he hadn't had enough as far as I was concerned. Okay. Yeah. So I waited on him after the game and, uh, and uh, he came out and we went at it again. And... Uh, I got that reputation. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I only got hit nine times in my whole career. With a pitch? With a pitch. And any do you think what percentage of those were intentional or just guys in No, oh, there were a couple because yeah. of the code. Yeah. 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 You know, we were playing uh, the Oakland Club in, in Fenway. Mm -hmm. And Chuck Dobson, the big 6'5", uh, right-hander, threw hard, good curveball, great stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. And Dauber was a f good friend of mine, you know. Was, so we're playing them and got to be either in the seventh or eighth inning. And we're down a couple of runs. And I come to the plate with two men on. And Dauber, I'm sitting on this curveball. Mm -hmm. Which is a crazy thing to do because if he throws one up and in, you're going to catch it right here, you yeah. know. But I was sitting on his curveball, and uh, sure enough, here he threw me a good curveball down and away, and I went out and hooked it over everything there, you know, with a green monster, and we beat him. Mm -hmm. So after the game was over, we go to this bar where all the players went. Dauber comes over to me and he says, Hawk, he says, you know, I can't allow that. I said, Dauber, I know that. I said, I do what you got to do. Can't, can't allow what exactly? You know? Hit him a bomb. He had to get his revenge. Hit, hit, <laughs> hit his big, good curveball. Okay. Now, if he hung it, no problem. Uh, okay. I see what you're saying. If he hung yeah. it, you know, yeah. it's, 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 then it's his fault. Not, right. But I hit his good curveball, and I said, Dobber, do what you got to do. And sure enough, the next time we played him, and he's pitching out in Oakland, first pitch, he got me right in the ribs. <laughs> and I just dropped a bat and went to first base. That's, that's the code. <laughs> that's the code. Yeah. And exactly. you can't do that anymore. It's I, gotten to be such a soft game. Uh, it, you know, let me ask you this. What do you think – you're watching or listening or following the White Sox regularly still, correct? Yeah. What do you think of all these different lineups and how often they're resting guys? And I mean, the injuries are one thing because if you're hurt, you're hurt. But it's like, oh, we got to get you on the kind of rest on the back end of a double. Whatever line. Tony LaRusso wants to do is okay with me. You got to be in that dugout. Mm -hmm. I mean, you got to be in that dugout in that clubhouse, you know. And Tony, the only guy that's only one other guy has won more games than he's won. And he's only, what, this is 34th year manager and 35th year? Something like that, yeah. And um, 
he's only been fired one time. And you're talking to the guy, the asshole who fired him. <laughs> so you you wouldn't fire him right now? What? You if you were GM, if you were Ray Khan right now, how would you handle this poor start? Whatever Tony wants to do is okay. Well, manager can only play, and Rick's done a good job. He and Kenny Williams have done a great job. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know. Uh, but it's like uh, Girardi. Just got fired. Yep. Yeah. He just got fired. He's a hell of a manager. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have any pitching. Yeah. But he can yeah, work. He's got like 12 DHs on that team, too. Yeah. And he, so he made, they made some bad signs, mm -hmm. yeah. you know. You can only a manager can only play with what he's got. Mm -hmm. I, the way I judge a manager is not wins and losses because if you're going to judge that, you've got to go to the general manager. Yep. And the scouting system. I judge a manager on how hard his players play. If they pop one up the infield, or they bust their ass down the line, or they just try down the line. Mm -hmm. Do you think this White Sox team plays hard? What? You think this current 2022 White Sox, do you think they play the right way? You think they play hard? Damn right they play the right okay. way. Okay. Would you, you, I don't think that – I think that Tony La Russa probably has you know, something to do with that, but I would say that T.A. and Abreu are the ones putting their foot down like, hey, you bust your ass every time you're on that field. I don't even think Tony La Russa needs to right now. He doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a good thing. Exactly. Right. See, Tony – I've known Tony since 1962. So that's almost what, 60 years? 60 years. Mm -hmm. 60 years, yeah. He was a 17 year old kid, joined us in uh, Binghamton, New York, in, in uh, Eastern League, which was a real good league. And uh, he, could, he was a good fielder, second baseman, good fielder. He couldn't hit, but he had something special about him. Mm -hmm. And you knew there was something special about him. And it's, it's turned out to be that way. And I didn't fire Tony when I was there uh, because he was a bad manager. And the reason I fired him is going to stay with me and him. I'll go to my grave with it. So there are certain things, you know, that uh, that's the reason I'm not, I don't, I'm thinking about doing a book, and but that'll never be in there. I so, almost feel like you should do a 10 part Netflix series with all your stories. You should. <laughs> like an hour, an episode. Of you, there was like that. I've had people want me to do. Yeah. What do they call it? Uh, what, what's the show? What's the, what the word they use? The podcast. Podcast. Yeah. yeah that's, that's what, what we're doing is. right now. Yeah. We're doing a podcast. Is this a podcast? This is a podcast. podcast. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Well, I I've think that would people, be. Yeah. I've had some people yeah. offer me a lot of money to do a podcast, you know. I, I could sit here and listen to you all day. I'm glad we have a 12 hour booking for this room, guys. <laughs> I also like listen to you tell these stories and talk about the code. I wish it you were bo born in like Alberta. I'm a big hockey guy. Oh, I and, am too. Oh, the way that you talk about the code and the two for one and standing up for your guys and settling it, you know, between the two of you. I mean, you were born to be a hockey player. You're just, you just better at baseball and golf. Yeah, born well, in the There's such a thing yeah. as reincarnation. I want to come, come back. back as one of three things. Okay. I want to come back as Neil Diamond. That's a good one. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. I want to come back as uh, an eye drop salesman. Okay. Because Why? I've had some trouble, you know, getting hit in the head so many times <laughs> with my eyes. I've had a uh, procedure done on both eyes okay. three or four times over. Oh, wow. Okay. And the third thing is a hockey player. I want to come back as a hockey. Hawk, you would be a natural. Let me tell you something. When I was with the Red Sox, uh, Derek Sanders and Bobby Orr used to come over okay. to my apartment a lot. Okay. I'll tell you a cute story. So they'd come over to my apartment. I couldn't go to the garden because of the fans. You know, I had, okay. to, yeah, had, yeah, yeah. had yeah. to stay home and watch Lucky. it on TV. And Derek Sanderson was known as like a wild man around town. Huh? It wasn't Derek Sanderson? Turk? Yeah. Yeah, when I got traded to Cleveland, I let him use my apartment. Okay. <laughs> and he wore it out. Yeah, I bet he did. I'm sure yeah. he did. I'm sure yeah. he did. Yeah. Literally He's known for that. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway uh, – they came over and Montreal was in town. Okay. So Turk says, Hawk, he said, who you want me to get tonight? I said, go get number 22. That was John Ferguson. And he was a badass. Don't do that. That's bad. <laughs> yeah. He was a badass, I'll tell you. <laughs> this is a friend of yours, Derek Sanderson? Tell him to go fight that guy? Yeah. Yeah, how'd he do? Turk said, I'll get him. Okay. Sure enough. Yeah. First time they hit the ice together, Turk gets his shirt over him. And he's just <laughs> down there and he's just pounding him. And the garden went crazy. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. know. Yeah. And uh, 
Toronto comes to town. So Bobby says, who do you want us to get tonight? I said, Bobby, go get Quinn, that big 6'4 yep. guy. Yep, Pat Quinn. And, yeah, yep. Pat Quinn. And uh, he had given Bobby a cheap shot the last time they had played. You don't do that. Bobby said, I'll get that son of a bitch. <laughs> and Bobby, people don't know it. Bobby was tough. Oh, yeah. He, he was like a monster of humor, well, right? The, the stories with Bobby Orr. No, he wasn't that big. He's my size, you know. Well, you're pretty big, Hawk. But yeah. Bobby beats the shit out of me. Yeah, they said that people, when he first came in the league, people would challenge him all the time. And then by his second year, we're like, now nah, we're good. Like, well, we're, we're not going to fight Bobby Orr That's anymore. the sequel yeah. to the story yeah. because Red Wings came to town. Turk says, who you want us to get? I said, go get the old man. He said, bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't mess with Gordy. Yeah. Well, that's if you heard of the Gordy Howe hat trick. You know huh? what that is? The Gordy Howe hat trick? No. It's when you have a goal assist and a fight in the same game. So you had to check all those boxes. That's a Gordy, Gordy Howe hat I trick. I played golf with Gordy at a charity event outside of Detroit. Okay. You know, what a good guy. Boy, he had forearms on him like this, you know. And then they had a. A celebrity home run hitting contest uh, at, at Tiger Stadium. Mm -hmm. Gordy was going in the upper tank. Oh, I believe it. Oh, I'm sure. I yeah. believe he it. He was yeah. going in yeah. the upper tank. He he was the a, left left center, not dead away center because there's 440 out there. But there, hockey, that's I love that sport. I mean, you you were born to be a hockey player. You were just born in the wrong location. I'm I'm convinced that you would have been like a Hall of Fame hockey player. Don't get me wrong. I've had my ass kicked a lot of times. Well, you just have to answer the bell. That's, I got them back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. And that's the thing with hockey, too. It doesn't even really matter if you win or lose. You just have to You just have to answer the bell and fight. Yeah, you got to yeah. get in the ring. Yeah. If you get in the ring, the respect is there. Yeah. You know, it's a sport to where if you really get pissed off at somebody, you can get right after them. That's yes. Just, that's you can get part. right yes. after them. This is, this is my guy. This is my guy. You know. Yeah. Hey, let's take another quick break here from talking to Hawk and let's talk about our friends at Credit Karma mm. Carl. Are you earning credit card rewards? Credit Karma can help you compare your reward options so you can find a car that fits your lifestyle, helping you earn miles or cash back for spending you're going to do anyway. Credit Karma uses your credit profile to show you offers that are tailored to your financial situation. They partner with a wide range of card issuers so you can be sure that you are exploring all sorts of card options. This is a great product. Yeah, it is. I mean, if you're caught up with points, I got points here, points there. What are we doing? Everybody's always offering points. Everybody's making you feel like you're missing out because you didn't get their points or you don't have their points. I got a buddy in my group who's always using points, talking about the points, making you feel bad if you're traveling without points. And I'm like, I, I just, there are points, guys. And then oh, you yeah. feel like you're missing out because you don't have access to being a point. We could do a whole thing about points, guys. And maybe we will one day. But I want to get back to Credit Karma and how they help me become a points guy and make sure I'm getting the most. Such an adult conversation too. Yeah. Like, hey, I'm looking to open a new car. You know of anything? What's looking good? We got the Venture. We got mm. this. Uh, what's this? Uh, with yeah. an S. Yeah, this. Uh, Sapphire. 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 Yeah, Sapphire. yeah it's a big. So why don't you just go to Credit Karma, figure it all out. Uh, best of all, Credit Karma uses your credit data to show you your chances of approval before you even apply. Helping you apply with more confidence. Comparing cards and Credit Karma is 100% free and won't affect your credit scores. Credit Karma, create your own karma. Ready to find the card for you, head to Credit Karma and check out your personalized mix of offers today. Go to creditkarma.com for or the Credit Karma app to find the card for you. That's creditkarma.com. The not checking the credit score is important too. And a lot of people are afraid about that, so that's that's nice. Get in there, guys. It's a nice touch. Get in there, you know. And if you want to take a trip, the points help. Absolutely. They certainly do. All right then, go get Credit Karma and uh, let's get back into Hawk Harrelson. So we're, we'll start wrapping up because I don't want to take your time all day, even though I could. But um, fast forwarding to the year 2022, Hawk Harrelson and the White Sox. You said you're following the team along. Give me your number one reason to why they were struggling this year, aside from injuries. Because like you said, the talent's there up and down the lineup, the pitching staff. They got and the pitching. Losers. But look at the, the, the pictures that are going down. I, I'm just firmly convinced. There's no question in my mind. And I don't know this game. Nobody knows. That's the beauty of baseball. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The beauty of baseball is that Hulk, you've been in the game all the parts of eight decades, which I, not many guys have done that. They said, you're an expert in the game. I said, bullshit. Nobody I, is. There ain't no experts in this game. Mm -hmm. 
There are no experts. And, you know, it's the only game we know that's not played against the clock. When you're on offense, the other team controls the ball. Yeah. yeah. Backwards. Yeah. So the beauty of a game is just playing hard. Playing hard. And, and that's what guys like Rico Petroselli and Yaz, uh, Yaz doesn't always play hard. And then all of a sudden, we get in the hunt in 67. He played his little ass off every day. He's the best left fielder I've ever seen to this day. Hmm. And the two games we had to beat Minnesota with Dean Chance and Jim Cott, he went seven for eight. <laughs> Just turns it on, has that ability. I tell you what, he, he was an unusual guy, and I say that complimentary. Uh, we're in Chicago playing, and he's in a funk. One of the few he went into, you know, everybody goes into slump in baseball. Mm -hmm. And he never talked to anybody. He talked to Ted about hitting. And, uh, but he never talked to any, anybody else. And so after the game, he comes up to me. He says, you won't have breakfast with me in the morning. And I knew what he was doing. He wanted to talk because I had him. You know, I, I yeah. knew exactly where his hands were supposed to be. And at the time, his hands were too low. Mm -hmm. And I didn't say. I never said I would work to him unless yeah. he asked, you know. Right. And he, only, he didn't only ask but one time, and that was in Chicago. So I said, okay. He said, what do you want for breakfast? I said, just give me some eggs and bacon, you know, and orange juice and milk. He said, okay. So I go up to his suite the next morning and – He's got a table like this, and he's got my eggs and orange juice and thing. You know what he is having for breakfast? Pizza what? and Beaujolais <laughs> wine. What? That's you talk about breakfast of champions. You, what'd you say it was? A hot dog and a beer? Yeah, that's yeah. another iteration of it. Right we there. made more yeah. money now. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Pizza and Beaujolais wine. And I'll tell you what. He did, he, was not, he was not a big drinker, mm -hmm. but he could sit on certain times, uh, whatever was going on, he could sit there and have 10 or 12 beers, and you'd never know, know he had a beer. He was just an unusual just, uh, guy. Even kind of kill guy. Kill, That's how right? I am, too. <laughs> but, no, I'll, I'll tell you what, if I had to – if I had to do it all over again when I change some things, sure. I think mm -hmm. everyone, all of us would. For sure. Yep. You know, but not many. Yeah. I wouldn't change many. Oh, well, look where he ended up. I, yeah. You know, in a room with us, <laughs> assholes. <laughs> you know, uh, this is not braggadocious. This is just facts. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was voted one of the top 10 high school player, uh, basketball players in the country. All right. All American there. I signed a football scholarship to go to the University of Georgia. Mm -hmm. Uh, I played in the British Open. Uh, I've done some things that the only other guy I know that could top it was it would be Bo Jackson, who's the greatest athlete I've ever seen. Yeah, mm -hmm. Bo was bigger than I was, stronger than I was, and faster than I was. He I played the British Open. Bo though. couldn't do it too. Yeah, so. I, when John Havlicek I used to joke around, I'd work out with the Celtics, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. when I was in Boston and I worked out with them one day and I don't know, Bill Russell was a coach and, and, uh, I, I was in there about five or six minutes and scored like 11 points, <laughs> but it also made me realize <laughs> <laughs> Bad News Barnes was – I went in to drive for the basket. All he did was this. <laughs> <laughs> I thought somebody yeah, crushed crush crush my ribs. Yeah. <laughs> Just giving you a little uh, – Yeah. But – uh, Underneath there? No, I, 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 I've done a lot of things in my life, and uh, a lot of my – I don't care to talk about, but a lot of things. Well, it, it's, it's – like we said, I, mean, I really could listen to you talk, tell stories. Dave was saying on the way down here that he wishes that you were his grandpa. And I'm like, you've probably spent more hours with Hawk Harrelson than your actual. It's true. All the, you know, three hours every, you know, 160 like, times a year. You, you so, see, even in the broadcast booth, 
you saw the human side of you. Like you saw the great baseball guy, obviously that was what you were doing. That was your job, but you saw the human side. For instance, like you just dropping your microphone, running out of the booth for Todd Frazier. Did, did you actually see him that day when he got hurt? Who? Todd Frazier, when you left the booth. Oh yeah. I thought it, I thought, I, I really his, thought his it, knee was gone. I thought it, it looked like it was. And I got criticized for that, but I didn't give a shit. No. I wanted to see how he was. Mm -hmm. And one of the other reasons was I didn't want our owner to be watching the game, which he does, and see that and be worried about him. Because mm -hmm. Jerry is very sensitive about his guys, his, yeah. his players. And I went down there, and uh, he he took a shot, you know, right in here. And mm -hmm. uh, his teeth went through his lip. His bottom lip there, you know, when you get to the side of that edge of that seat, and uh, I don't know one thing he 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 gave you everything he had. Yeah, Todd was you know real quick about Jerry. Do you think Jerry gives the team enough to win to win the World Series? Hell yeah! Hell yeah! Okay. Uh, you know, we in all my years with the White Sox, uh, the best manager we've ever had was Ozzy. Mm -hmm. Ozzy was the best manager because yeah. the guys played their ass off for him. They played their ass off at 20, too. Mm -hmm. But Ozzy's the only one to give us this in a mm -hmm. long time. Yeah. And there's only one other guy that's got a White Sox World Series ring and a Red Sox World Series <laughs> ring. Hawk Harrelson. Oh, and one other guy. It's a Carlton Fisk. Carlton Fisk. Carlton that, Fisk. Yeah, Carlton yeah. Fisk. But – Jerry, Jerry is is a man's man. People don't understand because he doesn't look like it. You know, mm -hmm. he's always in a suit and tie and everything. He's he's the smartest guy I've ever been around. Really, I love Jerry like a big brother. Mm -hmm. And his code is: don't ever lie to him. Don't ever lie to him. If you lie to him, you you lose him. Mm -hmm. He wants not stand for that. And he is tough son of a gun. I'll tell you that. I've heard him in some conversations with some of the hierarchy in baseball, and I mean, just wear their ass out. Uh, and he spends money. He spends money. People say he's cheap. Shit. <laughs> you, don't, you, you don't own the Chicago White Sox and Chicago Bulls if you're cheap. Yeah, that's true. That is true. <laughs> I'll tell you that right yeah. now. Well, that is that is some of the you do hear criticisms of that this year. Like, well, why didn't they um, bring back Rodon? Why didn't they go get a real right, you know, a, an improved right fielder? And he ends up being the villain. And I was want, just wondering your perspective, since you've been so close to the team and to him, if you ever watch in in January and February, it'd be like, man, Jerry, I wish you'd write one more check. You never have that feeling, Jerry. As I said, he's an unusual man. Mm -hmm. I've got two good friends here in Chicago that uh, what I call, I don't call many people a man's man. Mm -hmm. And that's Jerry and uh, Jeff Shure, J.J. Shure, who uh, owns Ditka's Restaurants. Okay, you know? okay. yeah. And uh, those two guys are – or what you call, and I, I can listen to them talk all day. Hmm. You you can, I've learned so much from Jerry. Uh, and even Jeff, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Just how they treat people. I've never heard Jerry, uh, except certain couple certain times there, abuse anybody. But I'll tell you one thing. I asked him one day. I said, "Jerry, I said, what did you, what did you do before you uh, uh, I forget the name of his company before you went into that?" He goes, uh, "I was a lawyer. I was a real estate lawyer." And he said, "I just got tired of putting people in jail." Hmm. Yeah. So I got out of that, you know, and. So started doing this rest on this path. Uh, history. Yeah. Rest yeah. is history. Seven yeah. championships. The it's 
It's a, it's a, every time I've spoken with someone from your perspective on Jerry Reinsdorf, it's never been anything but the best of words. Like Ron Kittle, same thing. Uh, AJ, same thing. Like they all adore Jerry Reinsdorf. It's White Sox fans, especially after they traded Chris Sale and Quintana and, and had that real bad stretch where they were rebuilding, tearing it down. It's just like, we want, we want, and, and we saw the first 50 games were not good and expectations are sky high. I'm always of the opinion that you got to go to the guy that's at the top of the food chain and say, hey, this is this ain't working or this is working, whatever you got to do. And he's been my scapegoat a lot of times, but I don't know. We'll see what these next uh, handful of weeks bring. But um, do they, like, this is where we'll end here. Do they got the TWTW to get over this hump and go and win this division and then make a run at the World if Series. If Tim Anderson comes back. He's coming back in two, three weeks, they say. Two or three weeks can cost you a job. That's, that is true. Yeah. That is very true. Danny Mendex, he, Danny Mendex been playing his ass off in, in Tim's absence. He's looking really good. Tim Anderson has become one of my all-time favorite players. My all-time favorite White Sox player is Mark Burley. Okay. Mm -hmm. Coop asked me a long time ago, he says, Hawkey said, I want you to look at this guy. We got a little left-hander over there. You know, he was in the Meyer Leagues. Mm -hmm. And I want you to go out. Uh, he's, he's working today. I want you to go over there and see what you think. And I went over there, and I watched him for a couple of innings. I said, shit. I said, he don't have shit. No, he doesn't. <laughs> but he's got guts. He had guts. And this. Yeah, the yeah. brain. You know, in yeah. his whole career, he never shook off one catcher. That's what never, AJ told us, yeah. Never shook off one time. AJ, to me, I'll tell you what AJ is. AJ, I've known him since, you know, he and uh, our daughter went to uh, high school together. Hmm. And uh, AJ's wife and my daughter roomed together at Florida State. So AJ is like a member of the family. Mm -hmm. And I tried like hell to get us to sign him. And uh, Ron Schuler was the general manager, and Danny Evans was the assistant. And Danny says, I don't think she likes AJ. And I said, why? Anyway, I said, AJ will probably be in the big leagues by the time he's 20, 21 years old. AJ's got the greatest baseball mind today, today, mm -hmm. that I've ever seen. Wow. He's going to be the greatest a baseball soon? mind. He looks at the game. He sees things that you and I and other players don't see. And we don't get, we don't have this without him. Nope. Mm -hmm. Sure. And when San Francisco, and you can credit Kenny Williams for this, when San Francisco let him go. That year he had 77 RBIs with the Giants, you know. And, and uh, when they let him go, I said, I called Kenny and I said, you guys thinking about AJ? And I'm not going to mention the player's name, but he says, well, this guy doesn't like him. He says, what's your take on him? I said, the only thing he does is beat you. I said, that's the only thing he does, beat you. He puts the right numbers down. And uh, I said, you know, when Minnesota was giving us all those problems when they had those good teams. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I said, AJ was the most devastating player they had for against us because he pitched our guys exactly the way they should be pitched. Mm -hmm. You know. Yep. So the next morning, Kenny called me back. He said, Hawk, I thought about what you said. He said, you think I ought to call his agent? I said, hell no, call AJ. Call him. So he called him, and the rest is history. Mm -hmm. And then when we found he was, what, seven years with us, and uh, finally uh, we let him go, and uh, I called uh, Nolan Ryan, who was running Texas, and he didn't call me back for a couple of days, and a couple of days later he called me back, and he said, Hawk, I'm sorry I was out uh California trying to sign uh I forget his name, big big player, big time player. 
He said, what's up? I said, have you guys thought about AJ? And he goes, not really. He says, let me talk to the general manager. He says, what do you think about him? I said, well, the only thing he does is beat you. <laughs> That's all he does. I said, uh, he said, a lot of guys. Who we got? A friend of mine in Detroit. Okay. But uh, last time that happened, it was Isaac Gein and it was Frank Thomas calling him, and we made him answer the phone right in the middle of the show. <laughs> the big hurt. <laughs> big hurt. Yeah. You still stay in touch with the big hurt? Huh? You still stay in touch with the big hurt? Oh yeah. 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 We we text and call each other. They he and Ozzy to me are the best pre and post game show. Oh, they're oh, great. They're great. I love them. They're great. In they're, baseball. Yeah. yeah. I don't like Kevin, uh, the guy who runs the, the, the station. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, but I told Kevin, I said, you got the best pre and post game they're, show. They're the they're the best they're together. Great. They're funny. And, they're relaxed. It's, it's, yeah. Tell the truth. Yep, they yep. do. They it's tell the truth. It's entertainment. Yeah, big time. Yep, it's entertainment. Yep. And do they care? Do you miss being around it every day? Going to sure. The yeah. Do, is there going to be any guest appearances? Like they had Gordon Beckham the last few weeks because Benetti and Stone had different obligations going out. Did they? Do they ever reach out? And be like, hey, Hawk, you want to come call a game? Or is that no. is that chapter over? I'm, that's done. Done. Okay. Done. Yeah, and I over got a lot of appearances lined up though. Okay. Good. Okay. Cool. Good. So uh, people I got one you. with Nicholas coming up. Uh, August uh, 7th and 8th. Where at? Uh, just where they had the senior tournament up in uh, Michigan. Okay. Benton Harbor. Yep. Okay, yeah, yep. yeah. Yep. So not far. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you're going to beat his ass up and down the greens? Yeah. Well, it's 34 miles from my house to Lost Dunes, which I belong to. Mm -hmm. That's one of the greatest golf courses in the world. Really? JJ. You know, okay. Get JJ owns it, you know, and mm – -hmm. uh, uh, a lot of the players go there to play. Huh. And even Joe West. Joe West, how's our guy doing? He's retired now too. He he's umpired more games than anybody in the history. Anybody in history? I think he right. started a podcast. Huh? He, actually, he did. He just started a podcast. I know. I was on it. That was his first guest. Oh, okay, that right. Go. Okay. That I I, I I did see that. So. You and him, and and that's the beautiful thing about baseball. Kind of like the code you were talking about earlier. I forget, was it, was it, uh, not, was it Arnold Palmer you were talking about? Or not Arnold Palmer, Arnold Palmer, uh, Jim Palmer, um, that hit you, and you're like, you got to do what you got to do. Put your head down. You and Joe West had some battles over the years. Oh yeah, that was just the beautiful thing about baseball. You guys can do that and be best friends. We're down off the. We're down in field. Texas. So Stoney says, uh, did you see uh, umpires? I hadn't put them down because that's one of the first things I do is when I go in the booth is put umpires down <laughs> to see because you got some, like anything else, you got some good ones, you got yep. some bad ones, and you got some horseshit ones. <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like any other profession. Yep. yep. And – Stoney says, uh, this is Joe's first game back. I said, back? Where's he been? He said he had throat cancer. So as soon as the game was over, I ran down the stairs there in Texas. I didn't even take the elevator. I ran, and I went to the umpire's room. I knocked on the door. Guy, uh, umpire comes, and he was shocked to see me, mm -hmm. you know. I said, where's Joe? He said he's in the shower. So I go back there, and Joe's lathering up. And I said, Joe. So Joe goes, Hawk, what's up, buddy? I said, look, I don't mind fighting you. I don't mind arguing with you, but I can't have you getting sick on me. And he started laughing. And since that time, we've been like this. Hmm. And uh, we play golf together. And, you know, my two rules, you've heard me say it over there many times. My yep. two rules, first is catch the ball. Don't mess with Joe West. You've got to catch the ball. Mm-hmm. And the next is don't mess with Joe West. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that a million times in all the other catchphrases, uh, the nicknames. Just it's I it it really truly bothered me that you didn't get the proper due when getting inducted into Cooperstown because you're you embody baseball, you personify it through and through, and it's such a beautiful game. And I know it's got its issues and its warts yep. right now, but you are like the perfect ambassador for it, the sport. It, yes, you yes. are. You really are. Yep. And um. 
thank you. I hope you can do this again. I don't know, a year down the road or whatever. Do a yearly catch up with Whenever Hawk. you guys want. We'll, Maybe we'll, we'll go take you to play golf. Yeah. Maybe we'll do that. You have the same room. We got to yeah. <laughs> hook up at Medina. And, yeah, and, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll figure something out for you. But it was well, great talking to you. Great to finally meet you. I can't now. Too. But yeah. a few years ago, I could hit a driver on my house. I promise you. <laughs> I'm sure you I can. promise you, you'll still beat the two of us. Oh so, yeah, yeah, yeah. We could play best ball against you. you um, still beat us. I haven't played in three years now. Oh, is that right? Okay. Oh, you, so you're hanging them up a little bit? Huh? You did hang them up a little bit. Hang up the golf clubs. Yeah, I got bad wrists. Bad wrists. Okay. Yeah, too many strikeouts, too many fast sandwiches. <laughs> yeah. I swung the heaviest bat in the league, and yeah, forty-two yeah. ounce. Forty. 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 40. That's like the size of one of my legs. Um, all right, guys. Yep, that I was appreciate great. you, Thank Hawk. You Can we get much. one prediction? They winning it all this year or what? Minnesota's for real. Yeah, they are. They're not. They're a good team. They got that that piranha attitude again, which I love, but I also hate. Just a little scrappy bunch. Well, Tony, if 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 we have a chance, Tony will get it. If we don't, he nothing he can do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You got some players don't play. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, some guys with sore legs and some guys yeah. with uh, hit a hit get a, out of my face. Hit a wall, bump into the yeah. wall and go on the DL. Mm-hmm. As I said, it's an agent's game today. Yep. Yeah. And there's no question that agents and you do it, and I you do it, and I'd do it. Mm-hmm. Especially with pitchers. Yep. To it's too much prolong to, the shelf life. Too much mm-hmm. to risk if you you know. Yeah. Go on the ten day. I told Jerry when they when they brought that ten day in. I said, Jerry, those agents are gonna wear your ass out. Oh yeah, they will. And they've yeah. done it. Yep. yep, they've done it. And I, I don't blame them. Uh, nope, hard to blame them. But Hawk, thanks again. Yeah, thank this, you, Hawk. This was spectacular. So it's great to finally meet you. Thanks for for meeting us out here. Yeah, it's it's been a pleasure, and uh, we'll do this again soon. Thank you, and uh, go White Sox. Yes, after we uh, go to the playoffs, maybe I'll talk to you guys again. I love that. Let's do it. All right. Snap. We're back. Back back. from the interview. Carl swapped out in swaps White Sox Dave and Chief. Welcome back, fellas. Hope it was a nice trip. It was a great trip to the great state of Indiana. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Um, We just got a couple more things to get to. We want to talk about the Bears situation real quick, and we want to talk a little Rangers. And I think that's uh, Stanley Cup playoffs, I should say. Yeah. Um, Did you got? What do you guys think of the? uh, of the Matt Eberflus uh, OTA, I suspension. liked it. What did you think? <laughs> I, I mean, I thought it was. Uh, it's quite the change from going to a coach who I don't definitely uh, didn't play these guys in one preseason. I think. Yep. It's quite the change to have them fucking suspended. Yeah, get a little yeah. rough around the edges in June. <laughs> so like, I, you can't have this happen too much because then you start to lose sure. picks yeah. and shit like that. But once in a while, a little slap in the wrist yeah, never yeah. hurt anybody. Give me yeah. the wrist, Dave. Never go. hurt anybody. Yeah. That was a good slap. That was a good slap. Thank you. I like guys competing. Mm-hmm. That's what I like. And I, I saw that and it was just like, this is, and it's just different. Like it's like you said, like it's a different change. And I read a quote um, from, I can't remember, it was one of the offensive linemen. He said it today. We were talking about, like, yeah, it's been like, I, I won't lie to you. It's been a very intense OTA. <laughs> so, you know, and he's like, that's fine. Like we're going to be ready to compete. And he's like, it's good. And, you know, I think everybody's kind of, uh, you know, I've heard from some other sources um, that there, like, people are really there was some question marks about Eberflus originally. It sounds like guys are buying in more, so kind of un- universally across uh, across the board. So that's that's good to see. You know? Said he was going to bring that fucking nasty back, yeah, so that's what we want. We want those these boys flying around, fucking getting after it. So I'm yeah. excited. Yeah. Uh, other thing that kind of kind of tickled me a little bit when it comes to the Bears was Cooper Cup's comments about. Um, our, uh, why am I blanking out his name? Jalen Johnson. Jalen Johnson, yes. Yep. I was bringing on, um, Jalen Johnson said he was one of the toughest guys that to covered him all season. He's a good player. Yeah. Yeah. So they, he is a good player. Yeah. So I don't know, like, when they're good again, how many guys in this 53 man roster will be there? Uh, cause it seems like they're, they got some, Ryan Poles has some work cut out for him, but, you know, this is like a culture year. So just a little bit of development from fields. Guys maybe getting fights in practice, a little bit too mm-hmm. chippy, a little too mm-hmm. physical. I like that set mm-hmm. of foundation and and uh, see where you end up. And for me, too, I don't know how you feel. A guy like Cooper Cup, it means a lot, too, because Definitely. Cooper Cup's a motherfucker to cover. Yep. He's just a shifty fuck. Yep. You know? He's a, one, maybe the best route runner in football. Smart. Those guys are hard to yeah. cover. Oh, like, yeah. Don't get me the wrong. Guys the cover. fucking big Andre Johnsons, the big Cal, those guys are fucking motherfuckers because they yeah. can get up there and really, you know, win a jump ball against the best of them. But I, at the same time, like, that jump ball has to be perfect for yeah. the quarterback and the range of, you know, the turn and everything, mm-hmm. the turn in the head and everything has to be so 
perfect to make that happen to, to cover a guy like Cooper Cup yeah. actually like kind of means a little bit more. Well, I remember might be a, crazy, a quote. No, a quote from this is this quote is probably from like five or six years ago. But Richard Sherman was talking about this was maybe it was like twenty, might have been twenty after the fourteen Super Bowl Patriots against Seahawks, and he was saying how you know like he was at that time like one of the best corners, if not the best corner in the league, and he was like, man, like I don't want to have to deal with Edelman. He's like, give me, give me like the, yeah, guy, yeah, the guys yeah. like the Randy Moss types. Yeah, and, and listen, we use bad examples: Randy Moss, Calvin Johnson, yeah. and uh, Andre Johnson are two of the best. Ever. Like, right. Maybe like an Allen Robinson. Sure, yeah, 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 right. yeah, that's where what you, I mean. Where you're gonna kind of run dig routes and yes. like and but it's like the double moves and the guys underneath where it's those guys can be extremely hard to cover. I kind of think Cooper Cup is a little bit of both. Like he can run those kind of perimeter routes that mm-hmm. are. And then he can get a little, you know, he just runs great routes, you know, yeah. no matter where they line him up. So, like yeah, that's that. great to hear. Yeah, Two positive Bears updates uh, this week. I mean, look at you, Mr. Positivity. That? Yeah. Let's win a Super that, Bowl. <laughs> the Bears are back? No. Want to say it? No. Yeah. Bears are not back. Yeah. Um, all right, let's do some uh, uh, Stanley Cup finals or Stanley Cup playoffs, I should say. Yeah. yeah let's get out of here. Yeah. Long I mean, show. the only the, – the Western Conference, uh, it's just a goddamn shame that we didn't get seven games of McDavid and McKinnon. That's like the only complaint. Every every game of that series, I, I think there was one one game, maybe game two was four nothing. It was not that competitive. Game one was eight to six. It was at bananas. Uh game three, four to two. And then the last game, the crazy comeback, uh, which I live bet, thought I got it wrong. I like double mushed myself. Like I bet the Avs live down one. They immediately gave up a goal to go down two. And I'm like, well, I guess I was wrong. And then as soon as I said I was wrong, the Avalanche right, ripped off three goals in a row. So it's kind of to your point where you're like, you've been like an incredible mush streak, Ed. You've been telling me that. And like I mushed myself into a win with my tweets. So, but that series was great. I was bummed we didn't get to see the roof pop off. I thought I was hoping the yeah. Oilers were going to win it over time. Oh, you know, that, just, yeah. Yeah, that would have been nice. That would have been, that would have been quite the scene. Just even though, yeah. I mean, the series, like, they're just so much better than them. They are. And, They're better than everybody. But like, at yeah. least give the give the home fans, give a the something. Edmonton fans a little something. They had a they had a good run. They had a very good run. I, that's a that it's one of those things where it's you watch them, and you're like, this team is not good. Like, and and Drysaitel was hurt. Who's you know Drysaitel in his own right is definitely a top ten player in the league, maybe top five. But it was just those two guys dragging, absolutely dragging Edmonton as far as they could. And I don't know what the record is, but they had 64 points in 16 games in this playoffs. That is, that's just like a number that just blows my mind for playoff hockey where it's so tight, it's so hard, all the teams are good, and it's those two guys combined for 64 points in 16 games. It's just it's astounding. And, the, the, you know, McDavid is the best player in the world, uh, and right behind him is McKinnon. And maybe Makar, like it is, so you just it was like pure electricity in that series, and then the other series has kind of been the opposite. Best it's, of three. Best of three. It's been a battle. Best of three. I gotta check in with our guy, producer Tom. Oh, uh, he's on life support. Is he? He's he's hurt. Admit yeah, you're vibe. hurt. Yeah, the vibes aren't great right now. I yeah. Mean, um. <clears throat> yeah, it's tough. I don't know if we want to go into the Rangers, but yeah, we do. Uh. Yeah, it's just it's a different feeling than the rest. Uh. There's there's back and forth between like reasons to stay positive and reasons to to be negative. Um, I think this whole playoff series, like we've been down before, we were down three to one, we were down mm-hmm. zero to two. Uh, it was different because you're like, well, like this team has the roster, and like we look like we can beat them if this this and this happens. When you're when you're going down the way we did, and you lose our second and third line centers, yeah. that's a, then it's just like. It's not even worth talking about. It's like, well, it's going to come down to them. If they, if Ryan Strome and Filipino are out game five, I don't think home ice advantage is enough. And I think that's like, you can't even argue that. It's kind of just a fact. So, like, it's, yeah. it's not even, there's not much to talk about. I do think home I ice think, matters so much more in hockey than the other sports just because you do have a strategic advantage in terms of matchups and last change and all that. Um, so, I think there's a reason why Gallant. I know the Rangers nine and one at home, eight and one, eight and one, and 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 I, I would argue as a Rangers fan, we're nine and zero. Oh. That one loss <laughs> was the third overtime loss to Pittsburgh, yeah, oh, game one, where right? Cabo yeah. Baco scored a goal and it was called off. True. When we throughout this playoffs, we've seen like almost like 
the exact same play happened. Yeah. And they called it the other way. So that one loss, take it with a grain of salt. Yeah. We're, so we'll, well, let's just call nine and one then. I know, it's, but it's split. It's a split it's on tough. a loss. It's, yeah. It's tough to talk like. Yeah. Like, to be positive. It's tough to talk projections. If yeah. those two players are out, it's almost like, well, then what are we doing? I don't like. Yeah. I would. I, I guess I. my only point with that was uh, you would hope that they would be able to hide those guys or give them favorable match because they're both clearly banged up. Uh, Strom's really battling out there, too. So it's they can kind of hide them. Hopefully, give them like you know all the offensive zone faceoffs, all the all the matchups against you know kind of the underbelly of, of um, Tampa, which they don't really have much of an underbelly. That's why they're so fucking good. But it's it's been a great playoff. It's been a great playoff, and I think you know now you're going to have the league's most exciting team in Colorado, probably the best team in Colorado against either New York City, original six, iconic franchise, a team on the come up. Or against the two-time defending champ, I think that's like a dream it's scenario. Be an awesome final. Stanley Cup yeah. playoffs. I think after watching like the games I've watched, like Colorado is horrifying. That uh, hits. And the, thi- and the thing is, we like, found out that game won too. Yeah, for oh, the yeah. record. Yeah, oh, I yeah. remember watching that game open uh, yeah. season opener against the Blackhawks, being like, "Oh my god, this is a different, <laughs> a different league." Yeah, and then yeah. they like kind of did they kind of level out a little bit for a second. I mean, I they, think just, they had a, f- they had no, a few. they had. They only they've only had two losses, and it was to St. Louis, and one of them was an overtime loss. I think he's talking yeah, about over the, the course of the season. season. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, Colorado. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we shifted there, but yeah. yeah so, good. yeah, I think they might. You know, they it's thought every team goes kind of through dog days a little bit. The Panthers won the President's Trophy, so they were technically the best, the, the best regular season team. But yeah, Colorado is they just have everything, and they can play kind of <sighs> any way you want. They got you know. They got some nastier, tougher guys. They got kind of those guys who do both. Like Nazem Kadri is kind of a mean fuck, but he's also can put the puck in the back of the net. The only thing they don't really have where whoever they play in the East will have a substantial advantage is in net. Yeah. So Shesterkin or Vasilevsky are way better than mm-hmm. Kemper or Frank, who's Kemper's been hurt. Um, so we'll see. It's going to be, be interesting. Yeah. That, yeah. That's so I think we're. Like I think one of those whoever comes out, I think they can steal a game, or, for sure, yeah. or two. But it's I, I think Colorado is going to smoke. Yeah, and the Too other much firepower. Yeah, and then they're going to be around for a while because McKinnon just like openly says like I'm taking less, and he has like he only makes like six point three. If you and you look at like a t- so they're so built, okay. And then you look at their cap situation, and it's like fine, and they have some young players coming. And then you look at like what Toronto has, where they have like this young core, but Matthews makes eleven something, Marner makes crazy, you know, like over ten. Uh, Nylander's up in that territory too, and it's just then you look at Colorado with Ranton and Landis Cog and um, and McKinnon, and they're all like, how the fuck do they afford those guys? And it's because they're all kind of taking a little bit less. So Tom, don't get mad at me, but I think I officially uh, want to see Lightning. Avalanche, just for the sole sa- the f- sole fact of like you got one dynasty if they win this one, yeah, and the, then if, like you're the way you're talking now, like the Avs got some you future know, dynasty potential, potential. Which for I know sure. it's a big word, a it, big thing oh to say. for sure, for, especially since they haven't won anything. Yes, it's very um, tough to say, but it does kind of you can kind of look into the crystal ball and be like, well, this is kind of like when the Bulls are button heads with the Pistons, mm-hmm. you know, and then the Bulls got over that hump and ran off a bunch. Maybe this Lightning team is going to be that Pistons where they won two. They're like the league's best team, like for sure. And that's intriguing to me. Yeah. As like yeah. a not, you know, obviously Blackhawks are out, no skin in the game. And I mean, you said it before, it's kind of house money season for the Rangers. Oh, entirely. Yeah. yeah. But so, I, so you could, to use another basketball reference, though, I think the Rangers are set up for a while, too. Yeah, they, yeah, they got yeah. a uh-huh. great young core. Well, that's why it's house money. Not even a doubt. Yeah. Yeah. So you could say, well, if this, if it's, if it's Lightning Avalanche, then that's Bulls Pistons. If it's Rangers Avalanche, we might be looking at like a Celtics Lakers situation where yeah. they play, they meet in the finals a bunch. Now, I did say that about Boston and Chicago back in 13. I thought those would, you know, and Boston kind of faded after that. And then I thought we would at some point get like Blackhawks Penguins, and they always just missed each other. That so sucks you just, too. yeah, I know. I was always, I always wanted a Taves Crosby. It would have been fun. Yeah. But it it's going to be, it's been, it's been great. It's been a great hockey playoff. And, Except, I'm rooting. I'm rooting for you, Tom. Thank you. Yeah. The uh, 
just ESPN broadcast has been horrible. It's been like, especially it's compared to TNT. TNT. Yeah, it's been biz is unbelievable. You talking in studio or you talking both? Just both, both. Okay. both. Yeah, it's horrible. And like, I'm not. It's not even me saying it. Like, there's like this weird, like heavy, like Tampa agenda for like it's by the at after watching each game, like I have to remind myself like we're watching ESPN and not watching it, the Tampa broadcast. Mm-hmm. Like they're so heavy, like yeah. Tampa it's leaning tough. in every in all the like all the language. Like when Tampa's down, they're talking about how good Tampa is and what they need to do. When the Rangers are down, they're like, well, you know, like Tampa's the better team. We like we knew this was going to happen. Like the, the Rangers can come back though, and this was like in the second period. Yeah, they're talking about they're already talking about like how the Rangers can come back in Game Five. I do think that if I mean, it's one of those things, Tom, where it's like, yeah, you had their your foot on their throat. In game, so in game three, that whole house money thing. I just, I wish that we could have gone, gone out in a different way. That's the part that hurts. Yeah. Like this guy, I mentally, this a is a two-two de- series, and you got two games at home. I you're men- talking about going out. I mentally, you're worse than the ESPN broadcasters. Accepted, I mentally accepted going into Car- uh, going into Carolina. Like it's a very, very possible we lose this series, and I'm fine with that. Whatever. Like mm-hmm. I was so high coming off a of pit. Then seeing what we can do against Carolina was awesome. Going up two nothing against Tampa, I gotta and agree. I gotta being, agree. Being up two goals yeah. in the in game three, I uh, I saw you in in the blink of an eye. Yeah. We were we were on the verge of going up three nothing. Yep. We are now going into New York with like our backs against the wall, Doom. and like Tampa is ramping up. In, Almost entire like, like on a, if there was a graph, it's like <laughs> New York's going down at at the same rate that Tampa's ramping up. It's scary. Brandon fucking point, Mike. Like he's coming back. There was a there was a quote from like Copper saying like it's like not not possible that he's back for Game Five. That's a death sentence. Yeah, um, I mean he's he's awesome too. Like, but yeah, no, yeah. this is this is different than the way like when we were down before. It's different. Yeah, there's mm-hmm. no. I this is a different team. And like uh, when you were saying like guys stepping up like. I think Heedle is so much more important than just like filling in the gaps because Heedle was like the core of that third line. Big time. And like I was saying, we didn't expect this third line. This this Rangers team in the play in the playoffs was They've been great. If you were to watch the regular season, it's a different team. Yeah. So this Rangers playoff team is different than the regular season team. So they, without they, that third happened, kid line, yeah, something happened in game Kako's five. Kako's different. Kako's yeah. so like mentally affected by the way he plays. Like without being on like a successful line where they're moving the puck and that kid that he uh um. Loff is great, I think, with that with Mika and Kreider. Yeah, I'd love that. But like, without that secret weapon that we pulled out of nowhere, we wouldn't be in the Eastern Conference yeah. Finals to begin with. So I do, I do think they're in a in a position here where they just have to load up. Like guys are banged up, and it's like, hey, like who's going? Kreider's going, Panarin's going, Mika's going. Panarin had the goal the other day, or or Laugh, and just get the guys that are hot. And put them together, and that's I think that like that's like a what, what would Joel do situation. That's what Joel would do. I think we'll see. It's gonna be it's it's so it's so exhausting. Yeah. How many times I've been through this? Game five is a must win because game five you win. Oh you yeah. You almost just assume you're gonna lose game six, and Correct. it's that same fucking thing. I keep saying to myself like game seven, anything can happen. Mm-hmm. So I think if we lose game five. Sorry, but yeah, I don't know much. So a far cry from a few days ago where I was seeing why not us tweets. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, yeah. yeah. But we're we're being we're being very yeah. self aware about that. This I is think. just the beginning. Though, yeah, Tom. I yeah. think. But there's like reasonings behind us saying that, like when it comes to injuries, like there's nothing you can do. Yeah, you know? you're, yeah. yeah. Uh, Dave prediction. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna go with the lightning for the third in a row. Okay, and uh, how, the, okay. This quite, is like when White Sox Dave talks about like the front office of the White Sox for forty minutes. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm just checked out. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I got, I got nothing. So. <laughs> Col- Colorado so they, will beat them. If there was a guy named Hedel on an NHL team, how do you think his last name would be spelled? Hedel. Hedel. Oh, yeah. Hedel. Yeah. Can I get a language of origin? Ah, <laughs> uh, this yes, guy's Russian. Russian. Is he Russian? Yeah. Hedel. Yeah, yeah, I mean. You're just never going to get it. It's a Chechen. Yeah, I think he's from Czech. J E D Y L. Say it again. J E D Y L. No. No. C H Y T I L. When I, everyone, every time I see his name, people call him Heedle. Oh, I'm like, Chidle. 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 I've, mm. I've heard that name and I've seen it. <laughs> you got, it's Heedle. It's a mental note. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I've always said Chidle. Yeah. Well, it's definitely Chidle, but it's pronounced Heedle. Um, well, yeah, we'll see what happens. Yep. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thank you to Hawk Harrelson for jumping on. Thanks to these guys for traveling out there. Happy birthday to my dad. And uh, happy birthday happy to Happy birthday, Tom's Mr. Dad. Tom It's my Lay. dad's birthday. I got to give him a shout out. Shout out, Gemini. 
Um, all gas. No brakes. And DJ play that shit.